All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is October 12th, 2023, and we're going to cover some exciting revelation, and we're going to rehash and cover some things that many people have been asking about lately. We know with everything going on in Israel, the the watchmen, brothers and sisters around the world are certainly on edge. But we have known for a long time how the revelation plays out. And so we're going to cover it again. We're going to rehash it. We're going to dig deep into it and, and lay out the picture that I believe shows we're not there yet. Are we are we probably at a place where we can say it's the wars and rumors of wars because that's something that has to begin in Israel? Yeah, I think that's fair to say, because we also can understand that if 2024 is the year that it would all begin, then this has probably got some sort of preparation and connection going on there. So what I will open up with saying as well is it's not something we need to to panic over. Remember, it said, be not terrified in Luke 21 when we begin to see these wars and rumors of wars. We don't need to panic. And here's why. We need to pray, first of all. We need to pray for the people of Israel. And on top of that, for ourselves, for all the watchmen, if we are watching and praying and we're diligently seeking the Lord, if we got the timing wrong, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Because what were we told in Hebrews chapter 11? To be like Enoch, you had to have faith that God was who he said he was and that he was a rewarder of those who diligently sought him. And what is the story of Enoch? Never having tasted of death. All right? That's how this plays out. So we don't have to know with absolute, this is going to be the date. If you're always watching, if you're always praying and you're diligently seeking the Lord, you're covered. However, in the revelation, of course, we're also diligently seeking the revelation of his word as, been, as has been happening here for six years. We've got it. We, we've been so blessed to understand mysteries that have never, ever been revealed till ministry revealed. I don't know. We've said this dozens of times. I have no idea why we've been chosen to understand it and to receive it. And so many others we try to share with haven't. I don't know. But what I can tell you is the revelation that we've been sharing, and especially these things that I'm going to start with, you're going to see absolute confirmation to things we've been teaching for the last several years. But especially the last few videos and the last couple in particular, when when we're talking about, you know, the 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 understanding of the true Jubilee count, the the wedding garments and what that revealed in Luke and in Matthew compared to what the, the garment was at the resurrection for the Mark group. Then you take the harvest of the earth of the last video and it is so perfectly fitting. It's crazy to be able to see how it applies to the three feasts of the of the Lord, how it applies to the discourses, how it applies to the comings of the Lord pre, mid, and post for certain groups at certain times. It's absolutely incredible. And as it gets going here tonight, that's how I'm going to start, is show you some incredible connections. One we've touched on over the years, but it was kind of like a side note. Well, one of our brothers, Mark, from Australia made a note of it in our forum yesterday in uh, the Ministry Revealed forum. Anybody that's interested in joining, you can come here to ministryrevealed.com and just click on the forum and sign up for a few seconds. It costs you absolutely nothing. There's no charge for anything. And you can come and join us in there if you would like to share and, and follow the news and events and Bible studies and, and ask questions. You can come and join us in there no matter where you are on the earth. And he had posted this thing about the meaning of a word, uh, of a name of a woman we know very well in Scripture. Well, that reminded me of it, and I thought, oh, this is so awesome. And so I decided to go look at the other name. And I went to go look at the other name, and wouldn't you know it, when I had looked at it in the past, because it had been a while, 
it it didn't really stand out as anything much. I might have seen something, but nothing too crazy. Well, in the last few years, with the revelations that have come since the last time I've really looked into her name, it was absolutely perfect. It was so perfect that it, it's it's crazy. And then I took these things and I went to the New Testament to see where these word meanings were in the New Testament. And wouldn't you know it, exactly where they should be when it comes to the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to over the tribulation years and understanding of pre, mid, and post. It was awesome. And so I'm going to start there, and then I'm going to build into this these events of what's going on now in Israel. Not so much saying, well, this is what's happening, but to show that keep watching, keep praying, and remain diligent in the Lord. If it is now, we'll be ready. But I'm going to show you why I believe it is not quite yet time because the scriptures have been revealed. We understand. Do we know everything? Of course not. We've never been so silly to think we know everything. But there are certain things we know with an absolute certainty. And from those things, the connections that are tied to them, we can know with a very solid degree of certainty. Especially when we're able to connect them to the feasts of the Lord, to the harvests of the earth, to the discourses, to the book of Revelation, to pre, mid, post, the creation stories. It becomes undeniable. And you're going to see more of that here tonight. It's so exciting. And so for anybody that's new and you just heard things like pre, mid and post all being true, you heard who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to hear some things if you're new that are a little bit foreign to you. You're going to hear things like this, 14 years of tribulation, and you're going to say, this guy is out to lunch. Well, I promise you with all of my heart, I am not out to lunch. I am going to show it to you. You can study the videos, the intro series that we have, and understand for yourself that it's absolutely true. The end of days is two sets of seven years, which is 14 years. It is seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. And there's a portion called above that we've revealed here for over four or five years now. have understood that that above portion, above 14 years, is 50 days. So if you're new, you can come to this playlist link right here on YouTube and click on this intro series right here. The Revealed End Time Study Note Series. There's 12 videos in there, but just watch the first four. You can also go to ministryrevealed.com. Here's the website. I was talking to you earlier about the forum. You can, where did it go? Hello. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I thought it used to be colored. Anyways, there's the forum if you wanted to link to the forum. But you can come to the intros right here. And that's the page I'm on right now. There's the first four videos that are key. This one is a 22-minute introduction video to what the next three videos are talking about. You're going to see this one is the first video on it where it's the 30-minute Bible study walking through the scriptures, revealing to you a glimpse in the understanding that the differences that are in the Gospels that so many people were thought of as, as either contradictions or things that we just don't quite understand yet, you're going to see for yourself is actually all prophecy. It is mind-blowing to understand. So if you've ever wondered what these differences were and nobody can explain them and you've tried to understand them, well, I promise you, you're about to understand what they're all about. Next, when you under, when you begin to understand that, this is a 30-minute video, same like the first one, but this one is when you understand the differences in the Gospels, you will then realize that the end of days, pre, mid, and post are all true, that it's Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And when you realize that, you're going to see Luke's is the pre-trib before the 50 days begins, and then it's the 50 days. When Luke's discourse is over, it's the seven years of seals for Mark and the seven years of trumpets for Matthew. You're going to see it's 14 years. And from there, 
what ends up happening is this fourth video is the big one. This is about two hours and 45 minutes, and it will give you the understanding how all of this was missed. And the title says it all. It's all because of Matthew. It's all because we've been taught for hundreds of years throughout the church history that the foundation of all teachings from the Gospels comes from Matthew. Because it's the first book, the first gospel, everybody goes to Matthew, even though the church knows it's written to Jews. They've never fully understood what Mark and Luke, or who Mark and Luke in the synoptic gospels were actually speaking to. There was, there was glimpses of, of possible understandings, but the revelation was never made known until the last several years. And this is going to blow your mind as you come to understand this after you watch the first intro videos to get here. I promise you, it'll be worth every moment of your time. Pray over it. Seek it in the scriptures. It's not my face. It's not me sharing everything, just talking. It Well, it's me talking, but it's not my face like standing at a podium. You're going to see the scriptures word for word yourself be revealed, and you can go to them yourself to track and to follow it and to see if it's true for yourself. And then you want to delve into the deeper stuff. Then you can keep going. This is a three-hour one, digging into the deeper uh, and further going into the differences in the Gospels and what they reveal prophetically. You, you're going to understand the discourses as you have never understood them before and see that it's pre, mid, and post Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You're going to see the typologies of pre, mid, and post everywhere, and it just keeps going and going and going ever wonder the seven churches we all know that there's going to be a prophetic understanding of the seven churches at the end of days well this is going to blow your mind but don't start there you need to understand the differences within the gospels and the 14 years before you get here so many incredible things it goes all the way down to this big daddy at the bottom this one takes it all the way back to the creations yep with an S, stories. And it's all about the prophetic revelation of Luke, Mark, and Matthew. It's mind-blowing. All right, so if you're new, you can come to ministryrevealed.com, the intro page, or you can go right here to the playlist on Ministry Revealed. <clears throat> so with that, let's take the next step. After I sip my coffee. All right, so we've been sharing... And like I said, I'm going to start with adding more insight and more biblical evidence to the recent videos where we've been talking about the harvest and how all these things prove out pre, mid, and post and who they relate to. You see, we've gone into Deuteronomy chapter 16, and I know this as, as much as I know the revelation of the Gospels and who they're speaking to. As much as I know it's it's 14 years and the 50 days above, I know the revelation of Deuteronomy 16 just as clear. And the way it works is it's it's the mystery revelation that many people have talked about over the years, which is 717. It is a mystery of end days prophecy, and we have revealed it here. We've shown that the unleavened bread, seven days of unleavened bread, which is called the bread of affliction, is a picture of the seven years of seals. If you've studied prophecy, you know that days can be interpreted as years and years can be interpreted as days when it comes to prophetic. You see this, it's even told to us in scripture, right? 390 uh, uh, for days as years on one side, right? Within uh, 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 Ezekiel. So we've seen this and it's in many places in scripture. And you're going to understand, as we've been sharing over the recent videos, this seven days of unleavened bread is a picture of the seven years of seals. And how does it play out? It plays out as six days or six years of seals. And the seventh is the year of solemn assembly. It, it's, when, it's when there's no more battles, no more things taking place. The seventh year of seals we've shown is... The, the Lord has brought the destruction and the devastation to the Antichrist and the ten, and the, and the ten uh, kings that are with him. 
Antichrist is killed. We know the story. It happens at the end of the sixth year in what will be the Ezekiel 39 war. Then the seventh year of seals is the 144,000 sealed. Then in about the midst of the seventh year of seals, we know is the great multitude rapture that will come in at unleavened bread, which is the second day of Passover. That is the spring wheat we've been talking about in recent videos connected to Rachel. Rachel, who is called the younger than Leah, who is the older. It's a picture of the two different wheat harvests. We've talked about it many times over the years. And then we see the seventh seal in Revelation 8, which is a short period of time. I believe it's only going to be between five and seven months. And it's silence in heaven. There's going to be this, this peace that takes place on the earth. OK, and that's why you see it as six days or six years. And then the seventh day or seventh year, there's not all of this events that were going on like the first six years of seals. We showed that the Feast of Weeks is the picture of the count to Leah, who is the older who goes first because the older has to go before the younger. That's what we were told in Revelation 29. That Leah and Rachel, the older and the younger, are a picture of winter wheat called old wheat and spring wheat called new wheat. We know by their harvests, the time frame of whatever year the tribulation is going to begin, we know the pre-trib is going to happen at the Feast of Weeks, at the true Feast of Weeks. So it doesn't go in order seven, one, and then seven. It actually starts with the Feast of Weeks. It goes one, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. And what do we know about the Feast of Weeks? The Feast of Weeks is seven Sabbaths from when you begin to put the sickle to the corn, which means wheat. Which means wheat. This is why when you put the sickle to the corn at the time frame that would be in the month of Taurus or Savan on the Hebrew calendar, and you put the sickle to the wheat, you number seven Sabbaths, and it brings you to the Hebrew month of Av. It brings you to the eighth day of Av. And then you have seven, uh, then you have 50 days count that brings you to Pentecost. And the 50 days count to Pentecost brings you to the 29th of Elul, the last day of the year. That is true. Pentecost. We've shown in recent videos, that's why the, the, the winter wheat, which is harvested in summer, is the one that could be crushed and used right away to make bread baked with leaven. And that's why in generally in September, maybe early October, is when wine is actually ready, having been harvested and crushed to make grapes. It's the only time of year where you can have Pentecost because Pentecost was connected in Acts chapter 2 to being when they were accused of being drunk on new wine. You can't have that in the end of May, early June. There's no such thing as new wine then. So we've understood and we've broke this down. Feast of Weeks is the picture of the pre-trib bride of Christ, old wheat, which means winter wheat harvested in the summer. And it is the picture of Leah. It's the representation of the pre-trib bride of Christ as the Luke gospel. Then you have seven years of seals, which is the picture of the seven days of unleavened bread. Why? Because it's six days as years, and then the seventh is to the Lord, which is why we see at the end of the sixth seal, the Lord is returned. It's now called what? It's now called at the end of the sixth seal. They see him coming. They, everybody's freaking out. It's the end not only of the sixth seal. It's the end of the sixth year of seals. The end of the first six years of tribulation. And when they come to an end, what do we know? It was the Ezekiel 39 war. And then, like I said, you have that one year of those events happening. And they saw the Lord coming on something. He was coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain carved without a hand from Daniel chapter two. And then this seventh year is, like I said, the assembly to him. I'm showing you this for a reason. I know we've just recently covered it, but you're going to see something 
absolutely incredible. A couple things, actually. And then you have the seven years of trumpets that follow next. They are a picture of the seven days of tabernacles. And then what does tabernacles have? It's seven days, and then it's the eighth day of tabernacles, which is the rest that is to the Lord. It's called the new beginning. Do you know what you don't see? You don't see six and then the seventh when it comes to tabernacles. Why? Because the seven years of trumpets, you have the six years of trumpets that we've broken down many times over the years. And then the final seventh year of trumpets isn't this gathering to the Lord yet. It's, it's the day of the Lord, which is called the year of his vengeance. It's the final 14th year of tribulation. And in that year, Antichrist, who has come back, false prophet, they're thrown into the lake of fire. Satan is bound. It's, it's Zechariah chapter 14. It's the final destruction of the enemy. And it's the year of the Lord's wrath. So there is no break in that seventh year. Like there was in the seven of unleavened bread connected in seals. There's no rest. There's no solemn assembly to the Lord until the eighth day, which is called the new beginning. And we've broken this down many times. I've been sharing it a lot recently. We know what it's the picture of. It's your seven years of seals that represent Mark. It's the sixth. And then there's your seventh year. The Lord had come at the end of six and he's here. It's the events that I spoke about. Then you have your seven years of trumpets. There are the picture of the seven days of tabernacles, but there's no six and then seventh. It's seven because this final year, the Lord has returned at the beginning of this year and it's the year of his vengeance. And it's not until the final Jubilee, the eighth day or the eighth year of the tabernacles typology, which is called the new beginning. And it just so happens when you track the Jubilees, when you track the Jubilees from Christ, based on what he said in Luke chapter four, understanding what year it was from Luke chapter three, you can track that from 2038, going from Tishri to Tishri, from 2038 to 2039 is the final jubilee. And it just so happens to equal 14 years from the Feast of Trumpets of 2024 to the end of 14 years to the final jubilee picture. And there's your sixth to the seventh of unleavened bread. There's your seventh, then to the eighth of tabernacles, days as years. And what happens first? It's the 50 days that come before the very end of the seven years. And when will that be? It'll be at the Feast of Weeks in 2024. We've been showing these things, breaking these down. And why am I breaking that down for you again? This is going to blow your mind. I caught it today as I was, I made another short today that's coming out, I think on Saturday. And it was this revelation in the midst of it that I caught. Check this out. We know at the end of the sixth seal, which is a picture of the end of the six, first six years of tribulation, that we see the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. We know it's on Mount Zion because he's coming on the mountain carved without hand. And we know he's going to be ruling from Mount Zion before the events take place in mid trumpets and he's cut off and we know why and how he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end when then the whole world will see him. So we know that they're going to see this, but nobody knows really what it is. Yeah, they're, they're saying hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. What is this wrath? This was the video I was doing today. Now we've taught on this before. But I want you to take note. Where is it? It's at the end of the first six years of seals. What was that a picture of? The end of the first six days of unleavened bread. What happens when he comes at this timing, right near the end of the sixth year of seals? What happens? Well, you guys know we've shared on this before. It's 
the first sword or the battle that takes place what? With the lamb. The battle, the war that takes place with the lamb when he's called Lord of Lords, King of Kings, only one uppercase L, one uppercase K. And who is he fighting? He's fighting the, the beast with his 10 kings because it's the Antichrist during seals and the 10 kings that are with him and so forth. This is when he destroys them. And Antichrist is killed, but we know at mid-trumpets, Antichrist comes back when the pit is open. This is that battle of the Lamb of the Ezekiel 39 war. So when the sixth year of seals ends, this battle is finished. This battle is finished. So when was the battle? Well, in Revelation 6, it's right, at, it's right essentially at the end of the sixth year of seals. Then you go to chapter 7. Here's the beginning of the seventh year of seals. And it starts with what? The sealing of the 144. Then at about midway through, because this great multitude rapture represents Rachel. As I'm also going to show you another thing to prove this out, to confirm it even more in all of their typologies. This is the picture of his Rachel. This is, remember, Luke is the Gentile, or is the pre trib Gentile bride of Christ. The great multitude is the house of Israel with the Gentiles that are grafted in. It's the sleeping church. It's the ones that he came for, remember? He said he came but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He didn't come for those who were already in Christ's spirit filled. That's why they're going at the beginning. The seals is to wake up the church that remains, the 90% that wasn't ready. Some will fall away and more will come in. It will equal the 90% of the church by the time the great multitude rapture comes with the ones that have died along the way in seals and those who will be alive when the time of the great multitude rapture comes. This is the picture of Rachel. This is why the new weed, as we've been teaching, which is the harvest season, is at the feast, the fall feast time, but it doesn't get observed, as you guys know, it's called Kadosh. It doesn't get observed until the second day of Passover, which is unleavened bread. You see? So what do you have? Six and then the seventh year. And this is what I was saying. So here's the rest now of the seventh year, which is the seventh seal. And this seventh seal, <clears throat> excuse me, about half an hour of silence in heaven. I believe it's anywhere from about five to seven months on the earth where it'll be a time of rest and peace. So that final year, there was nothing of destruction and events like that taking place because it's a picture of the seven days as the seven years of seals to the seven days of unleavened bread. And when did we see happen? We saw the wrath of the lamb, which was the Ezekiel 39 war at the end of the sixth year. But do you know that there's another war? Do you know that in Revelation 11, we see another wrath? And this wrath, look at where it happens. It doesn't happen during the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet is the second woe. Here's the second woe is passed. Now we're in the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet takes place in the seventh year. It doesn't mean... One seal, one year, one trumpet, one year. That's not how it plays out. But the, the, the end of six years of seals, which begins the 14 at the red horse, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, it begins at the red horse rider, the 14 years. And the first six years end at the end of the sixth seal. So from the second seal to the end of the sixth seal is the first six years of seals. Trumpets has, of course, the seven trumpets, and the seventh trumpet is a picture of that starting in that in that final 14th year or the seventh year of trumpets. Remember what we're talking about here. We just saw the Lord at the end of the sixth seal. So in the sixth year, at the end of the sixth seal, it was his war of the wrath of the Lamb. But we know that there's another one. And we know this one is what? Well, let's see what it says. In Revelation eleven seventeen. it says, saying, we give thanks, uh, we give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty. So you have the Lord God Almighty 
And what does it say in verse 18? And the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. So now you've got another wrath. This is the short coming out on Saturday. We know that there are two wraths. We've shared on it a long time. And, and our sister Donna reminded me in a comment today that, you know, oh, and the, we have the two wraths. So it was a great short to do. So thanks, Donna, because that led to this. Because this is another picture of the end of days of the seals years and trumpet years from the feasts of the Lord of unleavened bread and tabernacles. Where is this wrath of the Lord taking place? Is it taking place at the end of the, the sixth year of trumpets? No. It's taking place in the seventh year of trumpets. Just like the Feast of Tabernacles had seven days, not six and then seven, but seven, and then the eighth is the rest in the new beginning. We have the second battle, the second wrath in the final 14th year, which is seven years to be complete. And how do we know? Well, guess what? We take it to Revelation chapter 19, and we see the second battle. Here's the other war. Okay? Here's the war, and listen to what it says. Uh, Revelation 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he that treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. So Jesus is coming in the wrath to tread the grapes in the wrath of Almighty God. The other one was of the Lamb when he was the picture still of the Lamb. And look at what he's called here. King of kings, Lord of lords, all uppercase. When does this one take place? We know when the wine press is. It takes place in the 14th year of tribulation. We know this from Jeremiah chapter 25. In the day of the Lord, the year of his vengeance. It's the wrath of God and the treading of the grapes. When does it happen? In the seventh year. So not in the sixth, not at the end of the sixth, but in the seventh year, which means there's no rest in that seventh year. It's not till everything is done after the seventh year of trumpets tribulation or after the end of the 14 years, then the eighth year, like the eighth day of tabernacles, <coughs> excuse me, is the new beginning. You follow? We're seeing the exact picture of six to seven and then seven to eight as the days to years in the feasts of the Lord, in the years of tribulation, and the wrath one, and the wrath two, that ends it all. You see, this is why I'm telling you with confidence, I can tell you that we have understood Deuteronomy 16. There is no pre-trib connected to, to Passover or unleavened bread. There is no pre-trib connected to the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. The pre-trib Bride of Christ is connected to the true Feast of Weeks at the end of the seven Sabbaths from when they put the sickle to the wheat. Unbelievable. It's so perfect. It is so incredible. And I am so grateful that we can go through these things and understand them so beautifully. Watch this. Remember what? Oh, you know what? Let me finish on this note. Well, I guess I, uh, where is it? No, let me go on this note right now since we were just talking about it a moment ago. Where did I put it? Uh, let me just make sure. I put it way over here, but that's okay. I'm going to put it here because I'm going to, I'm going to show you now because it's, it's, it's where we are. Look at this. The word wine press is only found in Matthew chapter 21. It's not, remember, when we look at these things in the Synoptic Gospels, we get an understanding of who it's talking to. When, when we go to John, John isn't part of the Synoptic Gospels. He stands on his own. It generally gives us a picture of the time frame of events in prophetic years in John's 21 chapters. You see, why does John have 21 chapters? Look at it. To the picture of 21 years. We've shared on this many, many times. I know you guys know this. <clears throat> but look at this. We just showed 
And we've been sharing how the discourses or the gospels and synoptic gospels of Luke, Mark, Matthew are pre, mid, post. And what do we know the post is? Post, I just showed you, is the wrath of Almighty God in the final 14th year, which is the Matthew portion. And where's the word wine press found? Only in Matthew. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Well, it gets better. <clears throat> Let me show you this one. This is what our brother Mark had shared uh, in the forum yesterday that got me going down more of this trail. We've showed that the story of Leah and Rachel, we've showed it many, many times. You see, these are the first seven years picture of Jacob working for expecting Rachel, but ends up getting Leah, right? So he ends up getting Leah. But what did he say about those first seven years that he worked? He said they flew by like days. He worked seven, but he was so in love, they flew by like days. So even though it's a prophetic picture, of the final seven, 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 seven to the final 50th year Jubilee, we know that these are a picture of the seven easy years where the spirit is preparing the bride of Christ. But he also said that they were like days because he was so excited they flew by. And guess which ones are the most important that are connected to her? The 50 days where the pre-trib bride goes first before it comes to an end. Seven years, and it's 50 days before they end. That's connected to the bride of Christ, to the Leia type. Then you've got seven more years that he worked for Rachel. So who does Rachel represent? The Mark group. Who is the Mark group that we've revealed over the years? Mark, you see, Luke is spirit portion. Mark is the light portion. And Matthew is the flesh portion. We're all living in Matthew's period of time because we're all in the flesh. Okay? We can, those in the spirit are living in the flesh and have the light as well. They're the ones in Christ, spirit filled. Remember that from, from 2 Corinthians chapter 12? We talk about it all the time. Those who go first above 14 years, it says they're the ones in Christ. And what did it say about the second group that represents the great multitude rapture going to paradise? It says that the second one was kind of sort of, but not like the first ones in Christ. They're the ones with the light. This is Mark that represents the world, the, the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in. And Matthew represents the house of Judah and it's connected to the flesh. You guys know this. We've shared on it. So you've got the seven like Leah that came to be flying by so in love. They felt like just days. And then you had seven more years that he works for Leah. I mean, for Rachel. And what happens? He gets her at the end of those seven years, right? He, he got her after the wedding here, but he had to fulfill seven years for her. And she didn't start having kids till after those seven years. And then what does he do? He works six years for the cattle for a total of 20 years, and he makes a covenant with his father-in-law to begin the final 21st year. That's exactly what happens prophetically. We've shown it many times. But what I want you to understand is just as I showed, the wine press is connected to Matthew, and it's only found in Matthew's gospel. Wait until you see what we know about Leah and what we know about Rachel and the definition of their connected names. Check this out. So what do we know about Leah? All these things that I was just telling you about. Leah was older. Rachel was younger. Leah represents the old wheat or winter wheat that is harvested in summer, which is a true feast of weeks. And Rachel, who means younger, who is the younger sister, represents the spring wheat, which is they will go through seals. And in the seventh year at unleavened bread is when they come in. It, it, it's so incredible. Well, it gets even better. Let me show you what Leah's name means. Leah's name means weary. Okay? Leah's name means weary. Isn't that fitting? Isn't it those, isn't it the brothers and sisters in Christ spirit-filled who are the most weary 
in watching and in diligently seeking the Lord, you try and go talk to the Rachel types. Go try and talk to, to most of churchianity that's not prepared, not watching, not diligently seeking the Lord in his word. Are, are they weary? Not usually. Oh, they're weary of work and stuff like that. But not weary and hungry to go be with the Lord and just weary of, of, of the, the, the pains of the earth, like Paul told us, right? That we're groaning within ourselves to be with the Lord. Just as the earth is groaning, so are we within ourselves. It's the weary like Leah. Well, guess what? Where does the word leery, uh, uh, sorry, weary show up in the Gospels? Wouldn't you know it? The word weary just so happens to only show up in the Gospel of Luke. Remember wine press connected to Matthew only shows up in Matthew? And it's related to the end of trumpets, which is Matthew. Well, it gets even better. <clears throat> you guys remember this one. I haven't shared this one in a long time because I never went to the further. I mean, the last time I looked at the name meaning of Rachel was several years ago before we had the revelation of the creation stories and their connection to the pre, mid, and post. Well, look at what Rachel's name means, brothers and sisters. EU. Do you know what an EU is for those of you that don't? It's sheep. See, uh, which animal is EU? It's the female sheep. They're sheep. Do you remember what Jesus said about this? Let's go have a look. What did Jesus say about the sheep? Turns out we find out in Matthew chapter 15. Let's see what Jesus says about it. In verse 24, a key verse to understanding the pre-trib, uh, the, the, the mid-trib, great multitude, Rachel group, the, the creation story of days. Matthew 25, uh, sorry, Matthew 15, verse 24. But he answered and said, remember, he's talking to Judah here is the, is the picture, right? We're in Matthew and he's telling the Jews, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's not sent, but unto the lost sheep of Israel. Hello? Isn't this something we've been teaching? He's not sent, but unto the lost sheep of Israel. And who are the lost sheep of Israel? The Mark group. Not the ones that are spirit-filled in Christ. Sure, we're in the flesh, but we're living by the spirit. We're not living by the flesh. The world is what? The world is lost. The church that is asleep is unprepared because they're not watching and diligently seeking. So that what happens? They, they still belong to him in a sense, right? But they don't get to go pre-trib. They weren't prepared. They weren't watching. We know this for a fact. That's exactly what 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us when Paul prophetically is showing us that pre, mid, and post are all true over 14 years and the portion called above. The one in Christ, in Christ, goes above before the 14 years begin. And then what does it say? It says that that one goes like a rapture to the third heaven. What happens to the second group? This is the Mark group. I knew such a man. So people will tell you that this is Paul. This is Paul when he went the first time, the second time, and then the third time. What? So you're going to tell me Paul was in Christ. And at some point, Paul wasn't really in Christ. So when he went the first time in the prophetic, in, in the picture of what he did, he was in Christ, and then when he went the second time, eh, he was less committed and wasn't really so much in Christ so that that time he can go see paradise. Well, then when he says, now I'm coming to you the third time, and I'm not going to bring you any burden, where is he coming from? It's prophecy, guys. Sure, there was a story of events that took place in the is of when it happened. But this is absolute prophetic insight. It is typology prophecy for the end of days. 
because there is no way Paul is saying he was in Christ and then he wasn't in Christ when he went to heaven the second time. You see, this is your in Christ, Luke, pre-trib, Leah group. Remember, Leah was the most committed, most devout wife. What happened to Rachel? Well, we knew she stuck the idol under her thigh, right? Just so happens what's going to happen during the time of seals. Time of seals is the Antichrist, right? The image of the beast that they're going to have to endure. This is, this is the sleeping church portion who wasn't ready to go pre-trib. They're the Mark group. This is the group that Christ is coming to save in the great multitude rapture when he comes at the end of the six years of seals for the wrath of the Lamb. Watch this. We can prove it through more scriptures too. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 50. In Jeremiah chapter 50, listen to this. In verse 5 and 6. They shall ask the way to Zion. Remember at the end of seals, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the mountain carved without hand. We know from Zechariah 8 that they're now standing on Mount Zion and the temple is about to be rebuilt. It's a, it's a picture of the beginning of the seven years of trumpets. So when do you think this is? It says, they shall ask the way to Zion with their faces, faces titherward, saying, come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Well, remember what happens at the end of seals? Remember what happens at the end of seals? What happens at the seventh seal in about the, the midpoint of the seventh year of seals? the lord makes a covenant remember it's the lord who makes the covenant because we know he has to break the covenant when satan is cast down the pit is opened at mid trumpets the covenant is broken and we read about that as we have many times in zechariah chapter 11 and it's not until re he returns in the final year in the wrath of the lord that he renews the covenant in that final year this is the covenant this is that covenant that he makes at the end of seals and Let's prove it out. Remember, we're talking about the lost sheep, right? Well, listen to what it says in verse 6. My people hath been, past tense, my people hath been or have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go stray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Do you remember why this happens? Check it out. What do we know in these chapters to years? So anybody that's new, we call these chapters to years. These are books that have opened up to us that have prophetic revelation within some of their verses that give us insight to events that will take place in the end of days. And because we have the revelation of the gospels and the revelation of the years and the revelation in the book of Revelation, we were able to go read through these and find all of these little nuggets that give us details from the was and in the is to reveal understanding in the is to come. One of those books is Ezekiel. And what happens in the book of Ezekiel? There's chapter 33, a picture of the Son of Man here. There's chapter 34. Let's go to chapter 34 in the context of what we were just reading in Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 55 and 6, we can see it's the time when the Lord has returned on Mount Zion. He, he has had his, the wrath of the Lamb. And now it's in that seventh year. They're making their way to Zion. He's going to make that covenant now at the end of seals. And they were lost sheep. And now they're not. Okay? Because the Lord has returned on heavenly Mount Zion for the great multitude rapture going to paradise. Well, let's go to Ezekiel and see if we can confirm this understanding in verse 34, uh, sorry, in chapter 34, listen to what it says. Starting in verse two, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? And what ends up happening? They get in big trouble, right? 
the shepherds, the pastors, the priests all over the earth who haven't prepared their flocks, but have just done the same old and same old, not realizing the seasons and times that they're living in have just simply continued to do the same old, same old. And so why isn't the church ready? Well, it was prophesied to us. So of course it was going to happen. We're living in the Laodicean age before the seven churches play out again in the end of days prophecy, but we're in the Laodicean age. So of course there's a falling away as well. Well, that also applies to the pastors, to the many pastors out there, probably 90%, just like the 90% of the church that will remain. Listen to what it tells them in verse 5 of Ezekiel 34, 5 and 6. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep, my sheep, his Rachel's, his Mark group, his, his house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in group, wandered through all the mountains and upon every, every high hill. Isn't this exactly what we just read in Jeremiah 50? Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Who gets in trouble here? The shepherds are in big trouble. This is a picture of the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation. And they're in big trouble. They, they have caused their sheep to scatter because they didn't prepare them. Now, is this saying, oh, God did this in advance? No. God just knew this was going to be this in advance. And we could show it scripturally that 90% won't be ready, just as the story in the short that I did with the story of the 10 lepers. The Lord healed all 10. That's like the 100% of the church, but only one returned to praise the Lord and give him thanks. And then he says that he is, uh, what do he say? He's healed, which means delivered and saved. The other 90% went on their way like the sleepy church. Well, what if we go look up the word shepherd? Let's go see what the word shepherd tells us. The word shepherd, look at that. It's found three times in Matthew and twice in Mark. You see, because when the shepherd comes at the end of seals, he's here through the portion of Matthew as well, which is through the portion of trumpets. He comes to rescue his sheep in that seventh year of seals, and we know that he's here for the first portion of trumpets. So you're going to find the shepherd in Mark and in Matthew. But there's no shepherd in Luke. Why is there no shepherd in Luke? Because Luke's group is spirit-filled. Oh, we need the shepherd. The shepherd saves us. It is Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. He is the one who saves us. But because we are spirit-filled and diligently seeking him, watching and praying, that's the group that goes first. Then the group who is his Rachel, you got to remember the typology is he really wants the Rachel group. Why? Because if you remember in the story, so when you guys, if you're newer, when you get advanced enough to watch that, it's all a fractal video. And understand the beginning of creation, the days of creation, and the thousands of creation, and how they play out in a prophetic picture of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, or Leah, Rachel, and then you could say the cattle. It's the same prophetic picture. And if you remember what happened, we have that creation of males and females in that day's creation in Genesis 1, and they got corrupted not by their own fault, but because of the fallen angels that ended up being there, right? The, when, when the sun and the moon fell. We've shared on this a number of times. So all the way back from the creation story, this is the group that he lost in the typology to who they are now that he's coming to save. It's all about Mark and the portion of light. Let me show you something. If you're new, let me show you this in chapter 8 of John. Watch this. In chapter 8 of John, so you see seven chapters. 
seven chapters, seven chapters. What happens in the seventh year of seals while they're going to paradise? Paradise is what? The place Jesus prepared for them, where their mansions are. I told you there's a place, and when I return, I will receive you unto myself. Well, guess what? It's a prophetic picture that it's in John chapter 14. It's a prophetic picture of the seventh year of seals when he's going to receive them unto himself, unto paradise that he's coming with, to, with the place prepared. But look at John 8. John 8 is, is the beginning time of tribulation. And listen to what it says after he's with his Gentile type bride. Listen to what it says. I am the light of the world. Right there. Right at the start of that time frame of tribulation, which is the light portion, which represents Mark. When, when they're the lost sheep that he's coming to shed his light for. It says, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It's precisely what we've been showing for a few years now. And right where it should be. It's incredible. So here we have the shepherd at the place where the shepherd is, but not in Luke. You see, it's it, it's the where these places, where these things fit is absolutely incredible. Well, what about John? Notice now John is not one of the synoptic gospels. Remember, John stands on his own. Well, look at where the word shepherd is in John. In John chapter 10 is where it's mostly found. In one chapter, what is it? One, two, three, four, five times in John chapter 10. Well, do you know what John chapter 10 is right here? John chapter 10 is about two years, like two to three years, right? So it's after two. So it's in the third year, which is about two and a half years into seal. So about midway through two and a half years, okay? Midway through the third year. So two and a half years in to the tribulation of seals, we know it's when Antichrist shows up. And listen to the warning that you get in John chapter 10. Starts in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door unto the sheepfold, because seals is Mark's portion, but climbeth some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Why is he warning? Because the one who is the destroyer coming to kill and is the thief, who is the fake sheep, is the Antichrist coming. It's the picture of the Antichrist coming. The wolf in sheep's clothing. It's the Antichrist. And look at what it says. To catch them and scatter the sheep. Some he's catching and killing. Some are going to be scattered. Okay, it's the time when Antichrist will receive his power to continue 42 months. And this is a warning to pay attention to the sheep, to know that the true shepherd, when he comes, is going to come through the door, not some other way. It's awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Right related to Mark, right related to Mark where it is, not found in Luke because Luke's portion is the spirit. Awesome, right? It's the picture, as we've been saying, of the spring wheat or the winter wheat first to the spring wheat second. I told you guys, it's, it's crazy to see these name definitions. Like, Leah means weary, and it's only found in Luke one time in the Gospels. We go to the word uh, 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 EU, and EU is Rachel's name. And we know Rachel is, is, the, is the younger and it relates to having gone through six years of seals and then observed in the midst of the seventh year. And it's an exact picture to unleavened bread days as years of tribulation. We see the Lord when he comes. It's, it's his wrath and it's his wrath at the end of the sixth. And then he gets his Rachel and brings her in and so forth who are the lost sheep and he's the shepherd. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I you see, I've been getting excited like this for six years doing this because it blows my mind. I, it's so crazy to understand these things, to be able to see 
through the was and the is and to be able to pull out these prophetic revelations to give us here a little and there a little in the was and in the is to reveal the is to come. It's, it's, I don't even have words. I try to find the best words to say for it all the time to, to express the amazement of it. And I'm just left in awe every single time. So, so awesome. <laughs> And then you see, and then you saw the reason why. So that's why I started with the other one to be able to show that the second wrath is, is in. It's the entirety of the seventh year. So you want to see if we have understood the feasts of the Lord in their order. The answer is yes. Have we understood it in the feasts of, of when the winter wheat is ready, when the spring wheat is ready, when it's observed, the older before the younger, when the grapes are, when the grape harvest happens, how it's connected to Pentecost, and then it will begin the 14 years. How 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 it's connected to the fall feast time. And when the Lord returns, it's the treading of the grapes because it's the final wrath of the Lord God Almighty at the treading of the grapes. It, it's all in order. And it is based on the feasts of the Lord when they're to come and meet them. Pre, mid, post, feast of weeks, unleavened bread, and tabernacles so incredible and and it's exact it's a picture of these things that we've shared so many times look at this within look at this within the creation story this is more so for those of you who've been around for a little bit check this out within the creation okay what do we know about this this is the spirit group this is that creation that first creation that people call the gap theory we've shown that what it really is is a picture of the first seven days or 7,000 years if we were there in the flesh seeing it. But it really plays out like it might be just a short period of time. It's the story of Leah. It's the story of Leah. And it's those who are what? Spirit-filled. Who are the spirit-filled of God? Who are the spirit of God ones? You guys all know this, especially those of you who have been around for a bit. Who are they with the spirit of God in them? We know it from Romans chapter eight, like the back of our hands, Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And who are the sons of God? They are the heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Bam. That's the Leia group. That's the spirit filled Leia group who have the spirit of God in them. It's just like the story. John 1 tells us the same thing. And then what did it say? And then the word. So there's the word. Then the word what? Became light. What happened in verse 3? Jesus now becomes light. And God said, let there be light. Now Jesus has become light. How do we know this is Jesus becoming light? Because John chapter 1 told us. And now what is this a picture of? If this was a picture of the of the days you know he worked seven years but they flew by like days because it was a short period of time it felt like because he was so in love this was jesus so excited to make his creation in the spirit that it just flew by so we only get a glimpse of two verses and now what do we get here jesus is made light and you get the seven days of creation remember what days can be brothers and sisters they could prophetically be a picture of years but what else do we know? We know from 2 Peter 3, 8, that days are as thousands, comma, and thousands are as days to the Lord, which means these days of creation to the Father were days. But if we were there in the flesh in the period of time looking at it, it would have been like thousands of years each. So these seven days are 7,000 they would have been to us, but to the Lord, they were seven days. And days can also be what? A prophetic picture of years. So you've got the seven years of seals beginning with what? Light. Light. Whose portion is light? The world, the, the, the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and the Gentiles that got grafted in. He's coming to shed his light. And they're the prophetic picture of the 
of the uh, uh, males and females that were made, that were created in his image. The word for creation and those created are those from Mark's gospel. Go read it in his discourse. But they got corrupted. Not because of their own fault. They didn't know any different. In this corruption, it happened because of the fallen ones. It started here with the fall of Lucifer and, and one of his chief. One of his chiefs. It's a prophetic picture of the sun and the moon. That's why the sun and the moon are off course. The sun is what? 10 or 11 and a quarter days off course. Uh, the moon is, I mean, and the sun is two months off from the beginning of creation. It's a prophetic picture of the Antichrist and the false prophet. And it's seven days as seven years as if we were there, it would have been like 7,000. These were light beings. They were created in light. You see, if Christ, when Christ was, was made light here and they were made after his image, what image do you think it was that they were created in? Light. So he's coming to save who? The house of Israel that is now scattered throughout the earth, mixed in with the Gentiles. That's why the Gentiles got grafted in. And what is he coming to do? Save the house of Israel. He is the shepherd of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he's coming to shed his light on what? Those who lost the light. Those who lost this picture from original creation. Their light. Who was the first portion? Spirit. We're all living in, in Matthew's time of flesh right now. But there are those who are the spirit portion, those who are the light portion, and those who are the flesh portion. And the spirit ones are about to be taken out first. And it is the light that is his Rachel that he's coming to save at the end of seals. That he's receiving to paradise. And that's why when you go to Revel uh, Genesis chapter 2, you then see the creation of the flesh in Adam and then Eve. And from Adam, we're living in what? The 6,000... And then it'll be the seven thousand to be the millennium reign of the Lord, millennium reign of the Lord, which is their promised peace on earth. But to the Lord, it'd be what? It would still be his days. It doesn't matter that it would be seven thousand to us in the flesh. To the Lord in heaven, it'll still be as if it was seven days. So you have a picture of seven days that really flew by or seven years, or 7,000 that flew by like days, a short period of time, and it's the spirit portion. Then you have the seven days of light, who are his lost sheep of the house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in, and he's coming to save them. And it was seven days to the Lord, 7,000 if we were there, but it's also a prophetic picture of seven years of seals, for which Rachel is a picture of, of course, here we go again, unleavened bread, Set six and then the seventh. And then what do we get here? Then you have the 7,000 from flesh and the 7,000 from flesh is Matthew's portion. 7,000 from flesh, which to the father would have been and is only a seven days. And it's a prophetic picture to what? Seven years of trumpets. Unbelievable. It's so astronomically mind bending awesomeness to understand this. And I hope you guys grasp it. It is oh, every time new stuff can be added and it shows the picture. I mean, guys, we've been doing this for six years. Six years, week in, week out. Revelation, I believe, if not every single week, like 98% of the time, every single week, we're able to add to the picture. And we just added two more to clarify the revelation of the three feasts of the Lord, proving out the pre, mid, and post timing. The bride of Christ, brothers and sisters, in the year that it's going to happen, the bride of Christ, Leah, is going at the true feast of weeks. 
Now, what about this season and time that we're in right now? Well, let's get into this. Are we here? Well, I think you can kind of get the picture based on what I was just saying. We're not here. It's not the time. Do I understand why people were, were so freaking out because of this? Absolutely, I do. It'd be crazy not to, right? But look at where we are. What, what are certain things we know? And I'm going to cover them. But what are the things that we've been able to reveal here in this ministry and support it by pictures, uh, uh, by scriptures, I mean, by harvests, by feasts of the Lord, how the harvest play out, the discourses, the creation, the book of Revelation, the churches? What do we know? We know and and end by one we talk about a lot in the shorts by 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and its relation to the discourses. What does it say? Above. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years and it is those in Christ, the Leia pre-trib in Christ, spirit-filled Romans 8 that go above 14 years. We've broken it down many times as to what it means. Obviously, it has to be less than 15 years because it's above 14. It's not above 15. So it has to be less than 14 years, but more than 14. Okay? Less than 15, more than 14. So we've combed through the scriptures over the years and for several years now and through the one confirmation that through, through um, prayer, earnest prayer to the Lord that I received through our sister Jodell that nobody on earth knew that I prayed. You guys know the story. I received the confirmation of the Holy Ghost who said 50 and right on target. And that was the revelation of confirming the 50 before the 14 years. Now, we got the revelation through scripture, but I was about to delete that revelation and that understanding because I, I thought something was off, that I had missed something because the time had passed. Well, it just wasn't the year, of course. And it was so important not for me to remove that revelation and that, that piece of, of, of understanding that I received that one confirmation from the Holy Ghost right on target. And everything right on target has led us to since from Taurus and the bullseye of Taurus, the representation of it, how it was connected to the Shroud of Turin, and it's connected to the beginning of what? It just so happens it's when Taurus is the time when the sickle is put to the corn, which means wheat. Go look in history. One of our sisters confirmed this to us. I believe she works in languages, actually, our sister Ruth. And she talked about it in uh, one of the posts or one of the recent videos, I think maybe even the last one, that it is corn, right? That corn does mean wheat. That was the words used for it back then because there was no corn till about 500 years ago. It was discovered in the Americas. There was no corn. It represented wheat in the ancient days. So when we read that in scriptures for the Feast of Weeks, it's talking about corn. Uh, sorry, corn is talking about wheat. And we've shown it in scripture that when you go to certain places where it says corn, it actually, when you click on it, it tells you that it's wheat. There's just a few places where when you click on corn, it just means it just means grain, right? Tall growing grain. But majority of them, like 90% of the places, always uh, will tell you that it means wheat. And history tells us, and the, the history books, and, and the way the languages were in the past, it always meant wheat. This is why that last video on the harvest was so important because we know that they cannot, you cannot use spring wheat that is harvested in the fall and make bread out of it until the second day of Passover the following year, which we know is spring wheat is the picture of Leah's mid-trib, great multitude rapture. It is only the winter wheat harvested in summer. And when you understand that the sickle is put to it in the month of Taurus and you count your seven Sabbaths from when it starts, you hit the same place every time. So why am I telling you this? Well, first of all, look at where we are. Right off the bat, 
even in the midst of this chaos, and I know it's devastating, and we need to earnestly pray for, for Israel and for the Palestinians. Right? We, we, it, it's terrible what's happening over there. But is it the beginning of the end of days in the, in the 50 that we know and the 14 years? No. No. Like I was saying, what do we know about the 50 days and how it starts? <clears throat> One, we know that there is an attack in Israel that begins the 50 days. This is why so many people here in this ministry, especially because of the understanding of how prophecy is going to play out in, in greater detail than has ever been understood before, we know that when the 50 days begins, it's going to start with what's called a light affliction. Oh, it'll be devastating. I don't know how many thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even 100, 200,000 dead. We're talking about the beginning of the end of days. It's going to be devastating. So it was no wonder, knowing that it, this is how it's going to begin, that people here in the ministry were saying, this is it. It happened at the end of Tabernacles. This is it. We were looking to the eighth day. No, we weren't. We were never looking to the eighth day. We were looking to the first day of 50, remember? It's the first day of 50. How are the 50 days going to play out? Let me show you. Let's go to let's go to 2024 because I believe that's the year it's going to happen. And for those that are new and you say, oh, that's the year he thinks it's going to happen. Why would he think that? Well, let me show you why. If you do a Jubilee count year from Christ from 28 AD in chapter three, when Luke declared uh, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which the history books tell us was 28 AD. And we're going like from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets was 28 AD. And in Luke chapter four, Jesus says the acceptable year of the Lord. We know that the acceptable year of the Lord is Jesus proclaiming that now the Jubilee was at hand. So he was saying this late in 2028, which means 29 from Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets. Here's what we're talking about from 29 into 30 was the Jubilee year is what he was declaring. It is precisely what he was declaring in Luke chapter 4, 18 through 21. Knowing this and knowing how to count Jubilees, the Jubilee year after seven Sabbaths, see one, two, three, so it's seven Sabbath years, right? Seven Shemitah years and the Jubilee. Well, the Jubilee is year one of the next seven years of cycles. When you follow this based on scripture and history, you follow it in its cycle counts, and you get to the Jubilee in 2038. So Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets. Jubilee in 2038, Feast of Trumpets or, or Atonement, when they will make the proclamation, of 2038 to 2039 is the final Jubilee year, which is a picture of what? The eighth year of Tabernacles. It just so happened it equals after the year which is the year of the Lord's vengeance, we know is the eighth year of tabernacles, the new beginning, the jubilee. And guess what? It's exactly what it equals. For that to happen, it had to be what? The end of their 70 years in Jerusalem? Like Jeremiah says, then it would be the year of the Lord's vengeance, which is the treading of the grapes that we saw earlier, right? In the second sword of the Lord that happens in what? In the seventh trumpet, which is the 14th year? You seeing how this all fits perfectly? Nothing skipped. And when does that mean it starts? <clears throat> Excuse me. At True Feast of Trumpets of 2024, which means the 50 days are going to happen in this seventh year of 2024 at the True Feast of Trumpets. Uh, sorry, sorry. At the True Feast of Tabernacles. Sorry. <laughs> Let me say that again. At the true feast of weeks of 2024, it all begins. That will be the end of the seven Sabbaths from when the sickle was put to the winter wheat. That day equals the eighth of Av every year. The 50 days begin. 
when those 50 days begin, they begin with more than just an attack on Israel. So like I said, many people are looking to this attack on Israel right now as it potentially being the start. But what do we know about this attack on Israel? What do we know about this 50 days that comes before the 14 years? We know a few things, don't we? We know that scriptures have told us. Where am I? That scriptures have told us for a long time, something we've understood here in this ministry. We used to talk about this a lot here in this ministry. We go to Zechariah chapter 7. For anybody that's new, you remember when I was talking about these chapters to years? Well, Hosea is written to the Gentiles, quote unquote, house of Israel, right? With the Gentiles grafted in. And there's Zechariah. Zechariah is written to the Jews. How do you know Hosea is the Gentiles? Because that's what Paul told us in, I think, Hebrews 9. Okay, to Osi, those that were not my people will be my people, and her that was not my beloved shall be my beloved. That's the Leia Gentile bride. Zechariah is written to who? The Jews. To Judah. So what happens when you go to Zechariah chapter 7? It's like you're at the end of what? It, it, you're in this period of that end of six years of seals. You're in that seventh year of unleavened bread, right? That time where it's quiet. And we know that trumpets, <clears throat> excuse me, the Feast of Trumpets or or the trumpet judgments, I should say, is about to begin in chapter eight. So when we go to it, what do we find out? Starting in Zechariah seven, verse five, it says, speak unto all the people of the land and say to the priest saying, when everything is past tense, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those past tense, 70 years, did you ever at all do it unto me? So it's all past tense. So there's a time in the fifth month and in the seventh month that they would fast and mourn in those months and that they did it for account from something that began in 70 years, at 70 years. So it's saying, this is like what? The seventh year of seals. So it's saying past tense, there was something you did past tense of fasting and mourning in the fifth and seventh month, and you did it for 70 years, back then for 70 years. So if we go back to chapter one of Zechariah, chapter seven said those 70 years past tense, and what does Zechariah one say? Zechariah chapter one, verse 12 says, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have had indignation these 70 years. So chapter seven said those 70 years and chapter one said these 70 years. So there has to be a connection to a period of time, which means right now from essentially true feast of trumpets, 2023 to true feast of trumpets, 2024. Remember it's a day and hour. No one knows. So it could either be on the first or the second of Trumpets, right? Of, of the seventh month. What do we know about this? Well, we know that there has to be a 70 years that equals this final seventh Shemit, uh, Sabbath year. That, that in this final year is where these things have to begin. And what do we get? Well, look what happens. If we, tra if we trace this back, we end up with a count that began for us from 50 to 51, 51 to 52, 52 to 53, based on Leviticus 19, the first, second, third, and fourth year. And the fifth year, Leviticus 19 says, is theirs. So from the fifth year forward is theirs. This is something we covered a lot in the past, but we thought it was three years, and then we thought it was four. But one of the keys is that it pertained to Jerusalem. It wasn't just the land of Israel as a whole, but it pertained to Jerusalem. And what do we know about Jerusalem? Well, we showed that document. Let me see if I can, uh, <clears throat> let me see if I can bring it up. I think I can. 
uh, pictures. Okay, let me see here. Church history. I'm certain I've got it here somewhere. If not, we'll just have to do with, oh, let me have another quick look through. But we showed this document that was shared with us um, by our brother, uh, by our brother, uh, uh, Jake. And we shared it maybe like a year ago or less than that. Shoot, I don't know where it is. Oh, well. And we shared that when Israel came into the land, you know, we're not talking about all of Israel. You see, Zechariah is talking about Jerusalem because it's the Lord's land, the Father's land, where his name is. It's not all of Israel. It's Jerusalem that's his. And when they came into the land in 1948, you know, do we count from 48 or we count from 49? Well, what we have to understand is, oh, I even have it written down right here. The first year began on Tishri 1, 1950, making the first year uh, 1950 to 1951, okay? 1950 to 1951 from Tishri. So here's what we found out right here. Uh, I have it written down here. So we found out that after the Arab-Israel War, which began on May 15, 1948, and ended on March 10, 1949, agreements were settled in the summer of 1949, and Israel received a portion of Jerusalem April 19th, of 1950 now why don't we start the count from april then if they got it in april maybe we do a nissan count the reason we don't is because it is the house of judah that is in the land it's not the house of israel that's in the land right now it's the house of judah they're the ones in the land they're the ones ruling and the house of judah counts from tishri the house of israel counted from uh, Nissan. So knowing this, we count from Tishri to Tishri. And so do the end of days, by the way. Why do you think the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in who are the Rachel when they get to be observed, which is the great multitude rapture at the second day of Passover, which is unleavened bread? Why do you think they go at that time? Because they're the house of Israel. The house of Israel observes the beginning of the year from Nisan. But the Jews, the house of Judah, observe the beginning of the year from tabernacles. Their kings were count, were count uh, sorry, from trumpets. Their kings were counted from the seventh month for the house of Judah, and the kings of Israel were counted from Nisan. This is why we're counting from the seventh month, because it is the house of Judah in the land. When they got the land, when they got the portion of Jerusalem in April of 1950, the official count doesn't begin because they're Judah until the time of trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets of 1950. When you do the count, as Leviticus 19 then said, from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, first year they can't take from the planting of the trees, second year they can't take, third year they can't take. The fourth year is to the Lord. And then from the fifth year forward, which means Feast of Trumpets 1954 to 1955 was year one that began theirs to be able to eat from the trees after they had got a piece of Jerusalem. And then what happens? You follow those 70 years from when they first got the first portion of Jerusalem and the 70 years of Jerusalem and them getting it ends at the Feast of Trumpets 2024. What did Jeremiah uh, Zechariah say in chapter 1, which the chapters to years reveals Zechariah? Chapter 1 starts at what? The Feast of Trumpets of 2024. When? It said these 70 years, which means events begin in the 70th year. So, okay, wait a second. If the events begin in the 70th year, and we're in the 70th year right now, right? We'd be in the 70th year 
from true feast of trumpets, either day one or day two, we're now in officially the 70th year. Could the events actually be taking place right now actually be the time? No. Why? Because check it out. It says these 70 years, right? Something happens. Okay? The earth is at rest. You know, when are you going to have mercy on Jerusalem and the cities uh, of the south? And what does he say in verse 15? I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. I was a little displeased, but they helped forward the affliction. What do we know happens at this point? Verse 19, which have scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem. See, now they all get scattered. Judah is scattered. This is, this is what? This is the time of the true Feast of Trumpets of 2024 when they will be destroyed, when Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed and they will now be scattered. This is for Jerusalem. So what is this portion of, of things happening before, which is still in the midst of these 70 years? That's where Zechariah 7 comes in. Because Zechariah 7 says that they did these things Fasting and mourning in the fifth and seventh month, those 70 years. And we know that in chapter one, they were in the 70th year. So whatever it is, is connected to the 70th year, and they were fasting and mourning in it. Well, we're in the 70th year now. You see? So what is this fifth and seventh month fasting and mourning? Well, let's have a look. Let's go back to 2024 and look at what happens when we come to 2024. This is the fifth month for in the Hebrew calendar, and it's the ninth of Av. So what is the fasting and mourning of the fifth month in Zechariah 7? It's the ninth of Av. If you count 50 days from the ninth of Av, you end up on... The 29th of Elul, and what happens right here? Well, you would say, well, nothing happens. It's the Feast of Trumpets time, right? Well, yeah, the first to the second day, Feast of Trumpets, right? So is it the first day or is it the second day? Because it's the day and hour no one knows. So in this point right here, what are we expecting? Well, this is the end of 50 days right here. The 29th of Elul is the end of 50 days, which means... There's an attack coming. Because what is the beginning of trumpets? It's the beginning of the 14 years. And it starts with this nation against nation, but the first attack destroys Jerusalem. What were they observing in the fifth and the seventh month? What is their fasting and mourning of the fifth month? It's the ninth of Av. What's their fasting and mourning in the seventh? It's what they fast and mourn in the third of Tishri. You say, well, wait a second. That, that's beyond the date of, of, of the first. Why? But it, it's way over here. It's three days later. Do you know why? This is called the fast of Gedalia. It's the fasting in the morning in the seventh month <laughs> because of Gedalia. They had a governor historically of Gedalia who from the attack here, when the Jews and destruction was happening and they're fleeing and all these things going on, then things settled down. They brought on Gedalia to be governor. He was only governor for about six weeks because at the Feast of Trumpets, there was an attack that destroyed the governor in Jerusalem and the Jews were scattered. But because it happened at the Feast of Trumpets, they don't want it to overlap with one of the feasts of the Lord, so they observe it on the 3rd of Tishri. Go look up the Fast of Gedalia. It's in Scripture, and you could read it in history. We know when it happened, and I'm going to show it to you when it happened. But they observe it over here because they don't know if day one or day two is going to be the Feast of Trumpets. What is the difference from one attack to the second attack? 50 days. Hello. 
what did we say comes before the 14 years? 50 days. The revelation of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the above 14 is the 50 days. Well, guess what? Remember what the 8th of Av equaled? The 8th of Av was the 7th Sabbath from the Feast of Weeks. So from the Feast of Weeks, <coughs> that begins to be counted from the 16th. This is the time when the sickle is put to the wheat. Right in this time right here. And you count true Sabbaths. There's one, two, three, four, five. Where am I? Six, seven. This is your seventh Sabbath. And do you know what happens every year, late August, uh, uh, late July to early August? Summer. It's the completion of the summer, winter, lay a wheat harvest. When the wheat is Yoshon, they can use it right away. They crush it and they bake loaves of bread with leaven to bring into the temple or into the churches. It's been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. That date in 2024 on the Hebrew calendar is August 12th. What happens at the beginning of the 50 days, brothers and sisters? Is it just the first attack on Israel, which we're going to talk about? What is the prophetic picture of the beginning of the 50 days? What happens just before the start of the 50 days? 2 Corinthians chapter 12 said, the ones in Christ are like a rapture to the third heaven. This is the Luke chapter 21, verse 36 group that says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. That is the group going at true feasts of weeks. At the winter wheat harvest. Wave loaves with leaven baked. Which could only happen. With winter wheat. Right here. Pre-trib. Happens. Right before. The first attack. They might even be dropping bombs as the first attack happens. There might be bombs being launched into Israel. So by the mere fact, for one, that we're still here and this has already started, the, this attack has already started, for one, that's, that's really all you need to know. Really. We know the bride of Christ goes first. So if the bride of Christ goes first and the first attack happens at, in Israel simultaneously even, well, it's already been, what, six days? Because remember what happens? Remember what happens when this first attack happens, that the bride is gone, the first attack happens, and what do we know takes place? The seven-day wedding. Remember Luke? We'll come back to this. Remember Luke tells us only Luke has the word uh, uh, marriage or wedding in it and Matthew have it. There's none in Mark, remember? Because there is no mid-trib wedding. Remember what it says in Luke? In fact, let's go to Luke chapter 12 first. A lot of these things we only find in Luke and the differences in the weddings are only uh, between Luke and Matthew are the differences of the different groups. But if you remember what happens in Luke chapter 12, verse 35, he says, let your loins be girded about. So this is a picture, prophetic picture of Jesus speaking to his remnant worker portion. We call him the remnant worker bride, whatever you want to call him. This remnant group, which would have been part of the pre-trib, but they were chosen to remain as his remnant workers. He's talking to them in this prophetic picture right before 
he takes the pre-trib bride of Christ. And listen to what he says. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and he will come and serve them. This is the group that will remain with the Lord when he returns from the wedding. And he is the son of man, white horse rider that we're going to briefly cover. White horse rider when he comes during those 50 days, when he comes after the wedding for 40 days. The second watch is when he comes at the end of the six years of seals. And it's the 144,000. The third watch is when he comes at the end of trumpets. And it's the group that will go out during the millennial reign. We've covered all these things. So who, who is this first group? It's that Luke typology, that, that portion in the Luke story resurrection. We know they're the remnant worker bride that will be with them for 40 days, waiting for him when he returns from the wedding. And they will work at least during seals. And this group may work longer. Okay, we've talked about that and touched on it recently. Some will die along the way. Some will make it to the end and then probably die. All right. But this is the group, this first watch group, this remnant bride worker group. These are the ones that have part in the resurrection, as you guys know, at the end of tribulation, because they're going to rule and reign with him as priests and kings during uh, as priests ruling with him during the millennial reign. OK, we, we've covered this many times. Well, what else do we know about this group? What do we know about the wedding in this story? Well, in Luke chapter 14, we have the wedding feast. Matthew has a wedding feast. Mark doesn't. Okay. In we know the difference between Mark, uh, between Luke and Matthew's as well. We've spoken on it. We've got videos on it. It's awesome. We did one not too long ago. Okay. We're going to sit down in the lowest room. And if you get called to the highest room, congratulations. But don't be embarrassed by going to the highest room. And then you get called down to the lowest room. This is a conversation, brothers and sisters, of being pre-trib taken to the third heaven. And at the wedding, you're thinking all excited and you're going to go sit up closer. Don't go sit in the lowest room. All right. And if you're if you're honorable, a more honorable person and they're coming to get you, then hallelujah. Congratulations. You'll be brought higher by the angels or whoever comes to get you. OK, this is the pre-trib. Those from Luke chapter 21, 36 that are watching and praying that won't experience any of these things in tribulation they're gone at the beginning or at the end of the seventh sabbath right before the 50 days begins and what happens now well there's the seven day wedding i just showed you the seven day wedding when he returns from the wedding it's that leia seven day wedding now taking place so we're not looking for anything that's the eighth day and why would it be some random eighth day after the eighth day has already happened of tabernacles? We're not looking for the eighth day. I just showed you through the feasts of the Lord, through the, the, the harvests of the earth, through the grapes, through all of it, where the eighth day of tabernacles and what the seven to the eighth day of tabernacles actually represents. It's absolutely zip zero zilch pre-trip. This is going to equal not only a picture of the seven years of seals uh, of trumpets as the seven days of tabernacles. It's not only as a picture of the eighth day as the final jubilee, the eighth year of trumpet judgments or the 15th year after the 14 of tribulation. It is also going to be a picture of the Matthew chapter 25 wedding. And when it's over, it's the new beginning and the millennial reign. Everything we've been shown perfectly in order. So as we're seeing this, and we now follow this into 2024, we see this is the seventh Sabbath, and the 50 days begin here. So what happens? There's your escape. And what's going to happen first? You're going to see that there's a first attack that happens on Israel. It doesn't destroy everything. It doesn't cause them to, to scatter and to flee everywhere quite yet. But what is it? It's the one that's going to cause them to settle things down. 
even though you think all oh, this craziness now is going to be the thing that, that that's going to bring about the peace deal. Not yet. Not yet. Wait until you see more of what's happening in this and the people that are involved in what's taking place in Israel right now. Okay? So what do we know then happens on the 50 days? The escape of the bride, first attack on Israel, and so then what happens? Well, then you have your seven-day wedding. There's your seven-day wedding. And the Lord will return on the eighth day. The Lord returns on the eighth day. Okay? There's the Lord returning after the wedding. As he said in Luke, he will return after the wedding. And what do we know happens when he returns after the wedding? We've covered this number of times. We have the banquet parable, this great banquet, only in Luke's. Why? Because he told in Luke chapter 12, that first group, when he returns from the wedding, he was going to come sit with them, dine, and serve them, and eat with them. Just like he does only in Luke chapter 24 with those disciples. He doesn't do it in Mark, and he doesn't do it in Matthew. It completes st different storylines. This is why it's so important to understand the differences in the Gospels once you understand who they're speaking to. And so here he is having a, a meal with them. And what does he say they get to be a part of? That they're going to be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Of course. Because theirs is the resurrection at the end of tribulation. Again, we've covered it many times, but for new people. So this is the group that he's meeting with after the seven-day wedding. When he comes on the eighth day and he's here for 40 days, he's going to start by having a banquet meal with this group of remnant workers who will follow him for the 40 days. And we know them as Smyrna who put their necks on the line, okay? We know they go right at least through seals, here for 40 days with the Son of Man, through seals, maybe through trumpets, and we know that they take part in the resurrection of the just and will reign with him as priests for the millennial reign. This is that group he's meeting with at the end of the wedding when he comes back on the eighth day. And when he comes back on the eighth day, how many days is he here for? He's here for 40 days. Who is he? He's the white horse rider. Right? So 40 days. So there's, uh, what? One, two, three. So there's the end of his 40 days. When his 40 days are done, he was, what did he, what, what part did he play? He's the white horse rider. We know he's the white horse rider. We've proven out that he's the white horse rider. We know that other things happen during this week as well. We know there's a stone's throw coming. We know a meteor's coming. Absolute devastation, chaos. It's not only going to be an attack on Israel. There's actually going to be a meteor, something crashing through and bringing chaos. But where is this attack coming in Israel that many people have believed this was it? Is it coming to the south in the Gaza area? No. No. It's the coming destruction or devastation that's coming to northern, two northern cities in Israel. Wait until you see what I'm going to show you. I'm, I'm rehashing this for you guys that have been around for a bit because you're going to see where this leads. Okay, what do we know about Isaiah chapter 9? We know it so well. This was an awesome revelation too. There's a light affliction that happens first in Zebulun and Naphtali. It's a prophetic picture. These are two northern cities in Israel. And they're prophetic to Haifa and Tel Aviv. When does this happen? This is what happens at the beginning of the 50 days after the pre-trib escape. Two northern cities in Haifa and Tel Aviv by Iran, and maybe with still some of those proxies. Maybe they'll be destroyed by then, but then Iran is the one that brings this destruction with some sort of bombs in Haifa and Tel Aviv. Okay? Then what do we see? And the people walked in darkness. And the people that have walked in darkness, what happens? They're going to see a great light. <laughs> well, isn't that funny? Isn't that exactly what we were saying? That they're going to see a great light? And what's it connected to? 
for unto us a child is born. It's a picture of Christ coming. And for a long time, probably several months, maybe close to a year, I think it was several months, it was less than a year, I believe that this for unto us a child was born was directly connected to what we know about Luke in order and that Luke chapter 2 and the, the birth of Christ is a prophetic picture of the 40 days of Christ. What's the story of his birth? 40 days, the eight days and the and the 33, right? To the seven to the eighth and then the 33, it was 40 days. It's a prophetic picture of the 40 days of the Son of Man being here and it was connected to his birth. And what does Isaiah tell us? Isaiah is telling us the same thing, that after the destruction, uh, the, this light affliction, which is still going to be devastating in northern Israel to these two cities, prophetically telling us in the end of days, Haifa and Tel Aviv, what does it say? It says, for unto us a child is born. Well, this, for the longest time, like I said, we know that Christ was born in the third month, right? On the 15th of Sivan, that 15th to 16th of the third month born in Taurus. So it would seem like, well, wait a second. Maybe this is the beginning of the 50. Maybe this is the pre-trib escape. There's the wedding to here. And then the Lord comes on the eighth day at his birthday. That's got to be it. But then we don't have the count to the fifth and seventh month attack. Like Zechariah 7 was warning us about. We, we, we don't have the connection to the day and hour no one knows in Mark and in Matthew's discourses when the Lord returns on heavenly Mount Zion and feet down on the Mount of Olives. We don't have the, the fall feasts, end of six years of seals, and the fall feasts, which is when the spring wheat is ready, but it can't be observed till the middle of the next year, uh, uh, until about six months later on the second day of Passover. You don't get that count if we're counting all the way from back here. So for for a long for a few months it was it was I was twisted. I mean, is it directly at his birthday? But if it's directly at his birthday, then 50 days I think ends on something like um what what was it? Um it ends like of somewhere like down here or something like that. It's like it ends the 50 days somewhere in in late in the fifth Hebrew month. It equaled absolutely nothing to give us a prophetic typology of what was shall be. It was nothing. So if this is Jesus' birthday right in here, then, and we know Luke in order, and Luke chapter 2 is a prophetic 40 days from his birthday, and for unto us a child is born, and here's the first attack, and then the picture of him coming at his birthday for 40, uh, for, at his birthday for 40 days. I was scratching my head. Until. Until what? Until we found out where the prophetic revelation was this of what took place in the is. So what do we have here? A was prophecy that reveals itself in Matthew chapter 4 in the is. And we know from Ecclesiastes what was and what is is prophecy for the is to come. So if we go to the was and we go to the is of Matthew 4, <clears throat> excuse me, what did we discover? Well, we know that when Jesus came in, he was coming through Zebulun and Naphtalim, which is what? The prophecy fulfilled from what was spoken by Isaiah. That this is through where Jesus came and would shine his light when he begins his 40 days. Wasn't well, that amazing? Except there was one issue. This had nothing to do with Jesus being born. He was already like 30 years old. So when was this that it actually prophetically happened? Because we're looking for the 40 days of the Son of Man. And the 40 days of the Son of Man, who is the white horse rider, well, in Luke 2, in order, it's connected to his birth. In Isaiah 9, it's connected to after the attack, which we know is coming on the eighth day, and it's connected to his birth. But yet, when it was fulfilled, it never happened on his birth. When did it happen? The answer is found in verse 12 of Matthew 4. Now, when Jesus heard that John was cast into prison, bam, that was the answer. We know 
John wasn't cast into prison as soon as Jesus was baptized. It was about two months later. Because John, the whole story was about one year before Jesus officially took everything over on his own. There was about two months before John was cast into prison. And we have historical evidence from history, from the research we did, showing that John was in prison for about 10 months. Two months, still around, then cast into prison, then 10 months. So from Christ's baptism to when John was beheaded was about one year. Well, guess what? The answer we needed was right here. When Jesus showed up through these places as it had been prophesied he would, he didn't do it immediately. He did it after John was cast into prison. And John was cast into prison two months approximately after the time of Jesus' birth. So if Jesus was born on the 15th of Sivan or 15th of the third month, which we know through the sun, moon, and stars, we know it through other teachers throughout decades following the sun, moon, and stars. It's, it's proven. We've understood it, and we've proven it. Well, guess what? If you take two months later from his birthday, you end up on the 15th of Av. What? If it was about two months later when John was cast into prison and he was showing up, as it said here, that this being connected to Isaiah 9, saying that Jesus walked into these two places after they had been attacked and destroyed, right? After this light affliction, these attacks had happened, which we know is the beginning of the 50, and he comes to begin his 40 days connected to a period understood as his birth, but we know from Matthew 4 wasn't actually directly at his birth, but was about two months later. Guess what? There's your pre-trib escape. There's your beginning of 50 days, the seven-day wedding. And look at this. What's this right here? The beginning of the 40 days, son of man. What is it? What is it? It's two months from the birth of Christ to when he starts his 40 days. It's, it's exactly, it's precisely the connection to John two months later when he was cast into prison. Once we understood that, oh my goodness, everything just was exploding. Because we know this is where the real wheat is finished and the bread is done. We know that from here to here is the seven-day wedding from the beginning of 50 days. There's the first attack. It happens in northern Israel in two major cities, Haifa and Tel Aviv. When the Lord shows up, he begins after the seven days of the wedding. He comes to that group. He has the banquet meal with them. It's the start of his 40 days, which is two months after his birthday. And when the 40 days start, it takes us to about... What was it? The the 26th of Elul. And then what? When his 40 days are over, there are three days. Three days to the 29th of Elul and the end of 50 days, which would be the anointing at true Pentecost of the Holy Ghost. And when this happens, guess what happens? Wine harvest is September into early October. Hello. Isn't that exactly where it had to be for Pentecost because they were accused of being drunk on new wine? And when they're anointed by the Holy Ghost and what we call Acts 2.0 and they go out from Jerusalem in the prophetic end of days and the 14 years is about to start, what happens right after? They're attacked by Syria. And when they're attacked by Syria, they're destroyed and they're scattered throughout the nations the 14 years of tribulation will have begun and it will begin at the attack on jerusalem that causes them to flee and to be taken captive that is the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation and nation against nation don't believe me L let's see the rest of the story remember remember how it's starting the fifth and the seventh month what do we see 
the fifth month, fasting and mourning, to the seventh month, oh, the fasting and mourning is here, but where was the attack? Right here. 50 days apart from the pre-trib, first attack, wedding, 40 days of the Son of Man, three days left, which is when, which is when Syria will get his power, that, that authority, that, that red horse rider, that sword will be given. And this is the time when Jerusalem will get compassed about. But the attack won't happen till after the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the 50th day in our Acts 2.0. And when that happens and they go out from Jerusalem with that anointing, Jerusalem is destroyed. They're taken captives and they flee. Well, guess what? Let's read the rest of Isaiah 9. And what does it say? Well, remember what it said up here? There was the light affliction and then what? Afterward, a more grievous affliction. Where's this more grievous affliction? Comes after, at the end of 50 days. And who is it? The Syrians. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. But the Lord will have his hand stretched out still. What is it? Fifth month, seventh month. Can we show this historically? Of course we can. First of all, I just showed it to you from Zechariah chapter 7, the fifth and seventh month. We see it here in Isaiah, based on when it was fulfilled in the is when Christ was here, showing that it was two months from his birthday, which equals the 40 days from when the fifth and the seventh month attack and when he would come after the seven day wedding. Where else do we know it? Well, let's go into Jeremiah chapter 40. Here it is right here. Jeremiah chapter 40. The attack has happened, and now they put Gedalia in charge. When did the first attack happen? When? What caused Gedalia to get put in charge? They were attacked on the 9th of Av. It's a prophetic typology. It's a prophetic picture of the attack of the light affliction coming in northern Israel. Haifa and Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is Israel's capital. So what do you think is going to happen? Oh, I know Jerusalem is truly the capital and Trump declared it, but their offices are still in Tel Aviv. What do you think is going to happen? And they're going to have to put somebody else in charge, right? Maybe somebody that, that, that's loved and something else is going on. There's a, there's a prophetic Gedalia coming next. But this G prophetic Gedalia is only going to last till the early part of October. Because the attack of the seventh month is the attack of Gedalia that happens by Ishmael. And Ishmael comes in, and who does he come with? When does it get happen? It happens on the first day of the seventh month. Who does Ishmael come with? Do you know that Ishmael had 10 with him? Interesting, right? And what does he do? Jeremiah 41, verse 3. Ishmael also slew all the Jews that were with him, even with Gedaliah. What was the feast or the festival that they were having? It was the Feast of Trumpets. It was the Feast of Trumpets when Gedalia came with 10 men. He was invited to the party for this, for this settling down of things after the first attack. Isn't that exactly what we know is going to happen? The bride escapes. The first attack happens. It'll only last a few days. And then when the Son of Man shows up, all these things that we've talked about during the 40 days, there's going to be a settling down of things. Who's going to settle these things down? Somebody who's maybe involved with, with a peace deal or, you know, we know that the modern day Cyrus is the one involved with this as well, historically, right? We know that Cyrus in this story comes on the scene. We can go to Ezra. Right? Ezra chapter 1. And we now see Cyrus. So whoever this modern day Cyrus is going to be. 
makes this proclamation that they're going to be able to go and rebuild, but we know they're only going to get the foundation. Zerubbabel's there. And, and what was it from? It was from the attack. It was from the attack. Here it is right there. It was from the attack. Then it goes into the foundations being built and so forth. Because Cyrus is the one that makes this proclamation. We see this. And so when we go back, let's look at this in Jeremiah. I wanted you to see <coughs> in Jeremiah that we know it's Ishmael. We just saw that it was Ishmael that killed them, that killed Gedaliah. It is Ishmael that causes the attack at True Feast of Trumpets at the beginning of the 14 years. Well, watch this. When we go into Genesis chapter 16, we know the story. We've covered this quite a bit lately. That Abraham, his first child is Ishmael. He is connected to affliction. He's a wild man. Everybody is against him and him against everybody. It's the, it's the Arabs, right? And who does Ishmael represent? Well, Abraham was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. Genesis chapter 17. It, Abraham's now 99. The Lord makes a covenant. So 13 years later, it's like the 13 years of tribulation. And when he makes a covenant, Abraham's 99. So at the end of 13 years and Ishmael is 13. And then in chapter 21, Abraham's 100, so 14 years, and the promise Isaac is born. My question is, when did Ishmael show up on the scene? When did Ishmael show up on the scene? At the beginning of 13 years? At the beginning of 13 years. So there's a modern-day Ishmael who represents the beginning of the tribulation when the 14 years begins. And he's also a representation of the end of 13 years. As the, as the 13 years comes to an end, at the, as the sixth year of trumpets comes to an end, which is the 13th year of tribulation, before the promise comes at the start of the 14th year. Who's the modern day Ishmael? Didn't we just see Ishmael is the one who brings the attack? on Jerusalem, destroys them, and then they're scattered and taken captive. We know that prophetically that that is the beginning of the prophecy of the end of days. When who comes? Syria. When Syria comes. When does Syria attack? Syria is going to attack at the true feast of trumpets in the year I believe will be 2024. Syria will attack just as was prophesied in the was, happened in the is, in the typology, and will take place in the is to come. Just as the connection to the fifth and the seventh month, just as just as, as the first attack to Gedaliah being put in, to Ishmael coming with 10 men. Remember 10 kings that received power? And when does the prophetic typology of Ishmael start? At the beginning of 13 years. This would be the beginning of the 13 to the 14 years. At True Feast of Trumpets. Who's the one that brings the attack? The Ishmael type. And the Ishmael type is who? Syria. And at the end of 13 years. Is there also a prophetic Ishmael Syria type? Darn right there is. Watch this. Remember this? Is it uh, 2 Chronicles 24? Listen to what it says. We know Jerusalem is the prideful, um, uh, um, is the prideful, larger, devastating military of the Middle East. And Syria is too small to defeat them and come against them and really win. Oh, really? Let's see what prophecy says. In 2 Chronicles 24, 23. And it came to pass at the end of the year. Well, how about that? Right here. There's your end. Right? 
There's your end of 50 days. And right here at the end of the year, there's your attack. What does it say? And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against them. And they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. And the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men. And the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand because they, the Jews, had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. This is the first attack or, or the second attack, which is the one that is the red horse rider when the sword is given, when nation against nation begins. It starts with the destruction of Jerusalem. It is the second attack. And it will be the one by the Ishmael, Syria, Assad, with the smaller army against the more powerful Israel. He is the prophetic picture of Ishmael with Syria. And Ishmael's prophetic picture starts the 13 to the 14 years. Well, what did it also show? Ishmael was there to the end of 13 as well, right? What do we know happens? At the end of 13 years. Watch this. We've shared this in the past, right? This is so incredible. Look at this. So in 1 Kings 20, verse 15, halfway through, and after them, he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being 7,000. I want you to remember that number. So all the children of Israel at that time that are left were 7,000. Sound familiar? In the is, in Romans 11, God said that he reserves for himself what? 7,000. What happens when you go to Revelation chapter 11 at the end of the sixth year of trumpets? At the end of the sixth year of trumpets. Here's the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is what? The end of the 13th year of tribulation. And look at what we have. We're slain of men 7,000. This is the end of 13 years of tribulation. What if we go back and look at that prophetic picture of Syria in chapter 20? There's your 7,000, your prophetic picture again. And look at what happens. Chapter uh, 1 Kings 20, verse 22. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, go strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest for at the return of the year, which means what? Which means 13 years later, again, at the return of the year, what happens at the end of the 13 years of tribulation? What happens at the end of the sixth year of trumpets? Do you know it's the feast of trumpets? Do you know that Matthew 24 is the picture of the end of the 13th year to the start of the 14th year of tribulation when he comes on the day and hour no one knows? Hello. <laughs> it's so crazy to know, isn't it? At the return of the year, the king of Syria shall come against thee. And what does he say? And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain. Surely we shall be stronger than they. Right? So they're now serious saying their gods are the gods of the hills, but we will fight them in the plains because he's not going to be a god of the plains also. Right? And then what happens? Verse 26. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Benadad numbered the Syrians and went to Amalek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God and spake to the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, of, uh, the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but is not of God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. In verse 19, halfway through, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day. What is this a picture of? Syria at the start of 13 years, Syria at the end of 13 years. 
having the victory at the beginning to destroy Jerusalem and Israel, Jerusalem at the end, getting the victory, who is now a smaller remnant to the greater Syria at the end of 13 years. Who is Ishmael? It's a picture of Syria and probably Assad. It's the start of the 14 years at the red horse rider. Do you realize it's the son of man? We've shared here many times in the ministry, but anybody who's new, it is the son of man who is the white horse rider. We've proven it, and we're going to show it even a bit more. Watch how this plays out and is directly connected to what we're talking about now in 2023 and these attacks that have started that are not the time we're looking for because everything is connected to the true feast of weeks. And it just so happens that as we cover this 70 right here, coming to an end as Zechariah 1, we also know that 70 years of Jerusalem from 1967, when, you see, in 1950, when they got a portion of Jerusalem for the first time, we follow the Leviticus count, and that's what got us the count to 2023, 2024, meaning we're in the 70th right now. But it wasn't until 1967 when they were already in the land, but now got the rest of Jerusalem in 1967. It ends at the end of what? 13 years of tribulation. What happens at the end of those 13 years of tribulation? Then we just see Syria, the Ishmael type, who started with the first attack on the Feast of Trumpets here victoriously with a smaller army, when he comes at the end of 13 years, is coming with a greater army in, in Jerusalem. Judah is there with a smaller group. It's a picture now of what? Of Zechariah chapter 14. Here's the Lord. Ish, the, the Isaac now coming forth. Right? Isaac coming. In the 14th year when he turns, when Abraham turned 100 from having been 86 when it all started with Ishmael. And what happens at the end of this 13th year or 70 years? Zach uh, Jeremiah 25 said this is when the Lord will bring his vengeance, his day of the Lord, which will be the year of his vengeance. The final 14th year, which is what? The treading of the grapes that we were talking about at the beginning. <laughs> it's so awesome because it has to start within the the, the ending of a 170 and that the year of grapes, the treading of the grapes has to come after the completion of another 70. It's awesome. It's so incredible. So, so what are we seeing now in this time, knowing everything we've just gone through and being able to break it down and understand that, no, we're not there yet. But what is happening? What is brewing? What is taking place? Is There's something going on. And when you talk or you listen to some of the, the leadership or those who are behind the scenes, it's interesting that they believe whatever's going on right now in this, it's probably only going to last about two, maybe three weeks. If you look at most of Israel's wars, they don't last very long. Okay, they're small nations fighting against each other. They don't last very long. I'm not saying it can't go long for several months. We've seen, of course, in history, there, there are wars that have gone in for several months as well, right? In, in our recent history since they've been back. So we know they can extend for a few months as well. But there's something going on here. It's not what we're looking for in the prophetic end of days, but is it, does, does it have a connection? I believe it does. I believe it's connected to the wars and rumors of wars, but don't be terrified of Luke. But can we take it a bit further? Can we see what else there is? Well, hold on to your horses. This is an interview 
<clears throat> this was shared uh, again by somebody in the Ministry Revealed forum. I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was. It wasn't two hours ago. I think it was a day or two ago. And I want you to hear, these are a couple guys, uh, Jewish guys, Christians, I believe. And they're having a discussion with Avi Lipkin, okay? He's a Middle East correspondent. He's well aware and has been tracking this stuff for years. We're going to stop, as you can see, these points that we're going to make. We're going to listen to some of these things that he talks about and hold on to your horses. Because when you see the names that we have in Scripture, to those who are involved right now as we speak, oh, my Lord, you're going to see something's brewing indeed. This is definitely something going on. It's just not the end game yet. It is just the setup. Listen to some of this. To us, Avi, the origins of basically a coup that you believe, a, a deep state movement within the Israeli government, uh, this liberal socialist party that is trying to oust Benjamin Netanyahu and this Likud government uh, by allowing, you said, the Hamas to come through and invade Israel. You, you explained about these, these generals being part of a socialist party, even in Mossad. Uh, can you give us a quick recap about, about that from yesterday? The situation today is, and I'm asking, I'm looking at the camera now, all Christians should pray for Netanyahu because the whole idea of um, a coup d'etat is happening right now. And the, the, the switch that is bringing about the coup d'etat, the date is Saturday, this last Saturday. And um, there's, there are a number of people, you know, I watch all the news stations, but there's one uh, gentleman by the name of Yaakov Verdugo on Channel 14, which is right wing. And he said, from all this information, Ehud Barak wants to come back to be the prime minister or, or dictator or whatever. He's got to get rid of Netanyahu. And he's so fundamental in how he plans things that he knows exactly the date. Before this invasion happened, he knew the date when Netanyahu would be deposed. The date was this last Saturday, was the, uh, the invasion by Gaza. Um, and so now what's happening? All right, did you hear that? Right off the bat, we hear that Ehud Barak is involved on the far left socialist side, and he wants to take the power back. He wants to have uh, Netanyahu removed. But if he went to go, dispo uh, uh, to go and give his, uh, his disposition, uh, um, what is it? it, it um, what was that term that they used? But in going and give that 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 uh, um, talk about the events that were going on with himself uh, disposed, if he was going to go give that disposition, that <laughs> if he was going to go give that that talk, then it would have interfered with these things going forward, and people might have started to accept them more. That's what he's saying. So he wanted to stop that deposition. Thank you very much, Lord. He wanted to stop that deposition from happening. So they're saying that the, the reason they didn't move on these things, as you're going to hear even a little bit further, is because some of these generals who side with him, who are leftists, who side with Ehud Barak, were allowing this to take place. They will do the things that they need to, he's going to talk about later. But I want you to remember that there's something to do potentially with a coup and Ehud Barak is behind it. When you see what I'm going to share with you in a bit, it's going to blow your mind. You see, because as this all settles and there's all this devastation, it will be Netanyahu who has to shoulder the blame for the generals being slow to act. Because really, they're siding with Ehud Barak to bring down Netanyahu. Craziness, right? Not the first time we've seen these types of things. Well, I saw another video. I don't have it here for you. But I saw there was another one with Ehud Olmert. And anybody who knows about Ehud Olmert, we've done a video on him. He was a prime minister in Israel as well. And Ehud Olmert, is one that was so close. He was the closest one ever to getting a peace deal with Palestine. And it was about 2008, 2009, and then he was done and it fell apart and, and, and things happened. They believed and still do that if any of them can get it done, it might very well be Ehud Olmert. Whereas Ehud Barak is another Ehud who's trying to get rid of, of Netanyahu to take things over in the midst of this devastation, yet then they got to try to figure out in this conversation, you know, well, what about how do they put the 
you know, the genie back in the jar after having, quote unquote, maybe allowed some of this to happen. Wait till you see how I connect this for you in prophecy. And remember those names, in particular, Ehud Barak, who's involved in this coup potential things going on behind the scene, and how Ehud Omer is the one who was closest and who still talks with the Palestinian leadership working on trying to get some sort of agreement going in the back end and has for still many, many years, even though he's been out of office. I think Netanyahu is being blamed for it. Okay, let's go to, where am I? All right, right around there. Just told us is there's a deep state government within the Israeli government working to oust Netanyahu and his party. What is, we know their end goal is to get rid of him. How do they plan on stopping Hamas? Or do they think, okay, finally we give the order, we're in power, we're going to wrangle in the dogs of war that we just unleashed. What's, what's going to happen next? I mean, Hezbollah is joining the fray right now, today. That doesn't matter. The army, generals, who are all socialists, yeah. they're going to do, operationally, they're going to do the right thing. Okay. The problem will come after the fighting, in which Netanyahu will be blamed for the failures. When it wasn't his fault, the failures are by the, by the uh, general staff, and by all these generals who supposedly know their stuff, they knew what was happening. And, you know, in the Yom Kippur War in 1973, there were people who knew what was happening. Kissinger warned. Uh, King Hussein warned. Marwan, Ashraf Marwan warned. And the Israeli government had this concept that the Egyptians wouldn't dare to attack. And so we had this concept also that the Gaza wouldn't dare to attack. Why? Because Egypt Okay. So we can see they, they, they might have thought, oh, sure, they're not going to attack. But there were generals who want Netanyahu out who knew there was an attack coming, even in the midst of these warnings. Even though Netanyahu and others may have heard of it, they hear about it all the time. But to have had such a failure of response as what happened in Israel could have only come from somebody purposely being slow. Right? Israel never reacts slow. So something was going on. And that's the evidence that something was going on was the, the extremely slow reaction. So let's listen to this last piece. You have to remember this war that is coming with Hezbollah. And I think it's imminent. Today there was a news flash. You see, even this war, it, 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 this isn't the real thing yet, guys. Flash about missiles coming in from Lebanon, but it, it seems like it was, you know, unconfirmed or something. But the next stage is Iran. Now, why would America next want to get involved Iran. with uh, terminating Iran? Even though Biden gave them $6 billion, why would... Because they are an appendix to Russia. Russia is being degraded by the Ukraine already a year and a half. And so if you get rid of uh, Iran, bring about a Western government, then if Iran disappears, Hezbollah disappears, this uh, is another nail in the coffin of Putin and uh, Putin's Russia. So do you see? There you go. So you're hearing some of that? <clears throat> we see many things involved that we know prophetically. And the easiest part is, of course, the Iran connection with Russia and so forth. We know that, the, that this first attack that will happen, this not the attack that's already happened, but the actual one in the north that will devastate and in the light affliction in Haifa and Tel Aviv is the one that will come from Iran. Iran isn't out of this picture yet. And one of the reasons they're not just so easily, like you see Iran work through proxies, right? Through Hamas. It's all funded. They're, they're essentially Iran. But why then doesn't Israel just go and get Iran? Because it's got Russia. They're not going to war with Russia. They know if they go against Iran, World War III is at hand. So they're trying to bring devastation to Hamas in the Gaza Strip and in other places without causing World War III. But are there some that want to cause World War III in, in behind the curtains of things? Of course. But do, and do we know it's coming? Absolutely 100%. You guys all remember the video here from, you know, all the way back in uh, 2010. We know it's coming. But how does it start? It starts with a small Middle East war which is happening now, but there's a key piece that we know is the prophetic beginning, and that is Iran with Haifa and Tel Aviv. And we know the time frame, guys. We've understood it through the incredible revelation. And this is all that building, that softening, that, that building up to it continuously. Well, Remember now, I said Ehud Barak and Ehud Omer. You guys will remember this name Ehud from videos we've done in the past. The name Ehud 
is found in Judges 3 all over the place, once in Judges 4, and then a couple of different Ehuds over here. This Ehud here, let's go to Judges 3.15. Let's go to Judges, Judges chapter 3, and let's go to wherever it is. Okay, first one, and there it is right here. Okay, there's the name Ehud. And who's involved? Who's involved in the in the in the, in the coup potential portion? Well, it's Ehud Barak. Okay, Ehud Barak is, and Ehud, the name Ehud means united. And what does the name Ehud for united mean? It means to unify, to go one way or the other. This word is only used one time, and for those that have been around for a while. You know this. You know where I'm going. I, I I told you I was still going to the white horse rider, right? You see, I haven't forgotten about the ride, the white horse rider. I'm taking you the way there through these events taking place. So what do we see? We see the name Ehud. It was used nine times, of which I think six or seven of them, seven of them are in Judges 3 and one time in Judges 4. The root word of his name means to unify. And the name means unity. That Ehud, well, listen to this. A man left-handed. A man left-handed. <laughs> a man left-handed. Isn't he the left side? He's the far left. Okay. Interesting, right? Wait until we get to this for you new people. He's involved. But do you think all of this coup and all of this? And No, it's not happening right now. It's a slow and deliberate degradation and, and removing of, of, of Netanyahu eventually. Okay, it doesn't mean it's all happening right now. But we have an Ehud Barak, and we also have an Ehud Omert. Ehud Omert is the one that's trying to do the unifying, right? Trying to get a peace deal with Palestine and has been for a long, long time and still is, as I said earlier. But we've got an also another Ehud whose last name is Barak. Let's see what happens if we go and we follow through the story, see Ehud left hand. We end up seeing that that Ehud kills somebody, okay? Kills the, uh, this fat guy, it says, in the parlor and goes out and so forth. And then we go to chapter four. And it says, when Ehud was dead. So now the question is, was this is this a prophetic picture of Ehud Barak, or is it a prophetic prophetic picture of Ehud Omert who's trying to get a peace deal? Well, did you notice the other name? Here's an Ehud that dies, and who does Deborah put in charge? Check this out, J Judges four six, and she sent and called Barak. Barak. Are you ready for this? And she sent and called Barak, the son of uh, uh, Abinam of the that one, <laughs> and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee the 10,000 men of the children of Natalia and Zebulun? What? We have Ehud, we have Barak, and we have Naphtali and Zebulun. And there's an Ehud Omer who's trying to get a unity of a peace deal done for decades and is still working on it behind the scenes, has a great relation with the head of the Palestinian state, uh, the Palestinians leadership. We have another Ehud whose last name is Barak, who's trying to take over. Who's trying to take over with his group of leftists? And it would appear that at some point, maybe he does get control. And when he does, he would be what? Taking a group of people that would fight what? In Naphtali and Zebulun? In Naphtali and Zebulun? Um, uh, you mean like. When the first vexation happens, 
in the in the light affliction in Zebulun and Naphtalia? Is that is that the same time? Which we're prophetically showing you is connected to right here at the first attack in 2024. And 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 the guy involved behind the scenes in, in causing this with some generals. His name is Ehud Barak. His name is Ehud Barak. And we know there are two Ehuds in the conversation right now. And the one who's Barak is the one who's looking to take over. To end this chaos, blame it all on Netanyahu. Has the leftist generals in his pocket with him. And there's a period when he would be in charge. When something in Natali and Zebulun takes place. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, man. It seems like maybe what we're seeing is this coup is real. Maybe there really is this coup behind the scenes to get rid of and and make it seem like it was all Netanyahu's fault, which it, he'll have to take the blame because he is the leader. But it was the generals who allowed it to happen who are in with Barack, uh, uh, Ehud Barack, not Barack Obama, Ehud Barack, who will then eventually get the takeover. And when he takes over, it'll be a period of time when the first attack comes. What? Seriously? We're reading their names in scripture connected to the first attack. Which means there are events, there are things that obviously have to take place before it gets to this point. I am not a prophet. We have the revelation of prophecy. But I am no prophet. It is the revelation of scripture. Are we reading that Ehud Barak is the one who does end up taking over and will be the one there when the light affliction happens? Could be, brothers and sisters. It could be. Let's go back and look at this Ehud guy again. Remember this Ehud? Ehud, who I believe is maybe Ehud Omer, who is connected to the one trying to unify, as I've been saying for a long time. For those that are new, you're going to love this continued connection because his name comes from one root word, from one root word meaning to unify, to go one way or the other, like, like the deal, right? It's either going to go this way or it's going to go that way. And listen to what it, it's only used one time. You want to know how powerful it is where this is used one time? Are you ready for this, those that are new? It's in Ezekiel chapter 21. I know it like the back of my hand. Okay? Listen to this. In Ezekiel chapter 21, listen carefully. Who do we know? So Ezekiel in scripture is referred to as the son of man. Okay? He's always referred to as the son of man. Because why? He's a prophetic picture of the Son of Man. He's a prophetic picture of Christ in many prophetic typologies all throughout. And so we know when the Son of Man returns after the seven-day wedding and he comes on the eighth day, he's coming as the Son of Man who is what? The white horse rider. You see, when the seals are broken in heaven, they're not all broken all at once. The first seal is broken and the white horse rider goes out. It can be Christ. Of course it can. It's going to be the son of man. So what happens? The white, the, the first seal isn't broken until the white horse rider goes out. So in, in Revelation chapter 6, we see, let me see, I think I have it brought up here. In Revelation chapter 6, listen to what it says in verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. How clear is that? One of the seals. And when he had opened one of the seals, the white horse rider goes out. We've broken down bow and how, it, how it's connected to the woman in travail. 
um, which is representative of his 40 days. We showed the crown because of the crown that he gets at his wedding that his mother gave him, like in uh, in Song of Solomon 3, uh, 11, right? The word conquering, it's, I mean, we've broken all this down. We know it's the white horse rider is the son of man, and we know it's connected to the above 14 years because the 40 days is within those 50 days. And we know that Luke's discourse tells us if you remember, in Luke's discourse, it says the same thing when it says, but before all these. When it says, but before all these, what is it saying? But before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is a picture of his 40 days. There's going to be chaos. There's going to be those that are with him cast into prison. Some are going to be killed. You got to remember, tens of millions of people will have vanished. There will have been some meteor just devastation coming. There will have been a first attack on Israel while they're then trying to settle things down in the midst of chaos. This is all about the 40 days. And you see the Lord warning as he said he would, as Jonah did, he would warn as Jonah did for 40 days. And we see in Luke when he warns about Jerusalem being compassed about. Which means he's warning during the 40 days or in the midst of the 50 before Jerusalem is surrounded and destroyed. When does Jerusalem get surrounded and destroyed? Not until his 40 days are done. And what is left, what's remaining in the 50 days? Three days. So when he goes, what happens? There's three days when the compassing about by Syria begins. And when the 50 days are done, when that anointing of the Holy Ghost takes place and they go out from Jerusalem, the sword is given. Peace. Peace is removed from the earth, and the sword is given of the red horse rider. We've taught on this many times. Look at what it says. When he's gone, now when the 40 days are done, when the Son of Man has gone back, the white horse rider is left. How many days are there before the second seal? Three days. He's got three days on in earth time before that second seal is open. That's why I told you when he opened one of the seals. When his 40 days are over and the three days pass, then he opens the second seal. And what happens to the red horse rider? It says, and what is the red horse rider? It's the beginning of the 14 years. And it's the attack that begins with Jerusalem, World War III breaking out on Jerusalem, which is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom beginning. And what does it say about the red horse rider? And power is given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. Well, isn't that funny? Peace just left the earth when it anointed in Acts 2.0 at true Pentecost. It anointed them in the Acts 2.0 and left. And they went out from Jerusalem. And now the attack happens. You see? So look at then what it says. And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. When did they begin to kill one another? At nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Right? Not, that's why Mark's discourse and Matthew's, but let's go to Mark's. Mark's discourse has no but first. It just goes to what? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This first war that breaks out, this first devastation is against Jerusalem. And then World War III breaks out from there. Luke's was, but before all these. It's the red horse rider that begins the 14 years at true feast of trumpets, which I believe will be the one for next year. And what does this have to do with Ezekiel 21 and the son of man? Well, remember, we're talking about this Ehud and a connection to Ehud, maybe Ehud Barak. Listen to what Ezekiel 21 says. Son of man, set thy face toward Jerusalem. And drop thy word toward thy, the, the holy places and prophesy against the land of Israel and say unto the land of Israel, thus saith the Lord, behold, I am against thee. He's against his land, right? Because he, he remember what it said in, in Zechariah 1? It said the angel was saying, how long, Lord, will you not have mercy against your land? Against your land. He needs to let his land rest before the temple can be built. 
That's why Israel, that's why Jerusalem has to be destroyed so it can rest for seven years before the temple can get rebuilt at the start of trumpets. Hello. Say to the land of Israel, thus saith the Lord, behold, I'm against thee. I will draw forth my sword out of his sheath. What? I will draw my sword out of his sheath and I will cut off from the, the righteous and the wicked. Okay. The righteous and the wicked, therefore, shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh from the south to the north. Uh, we keep going down. Uh, Melt, Fain, verse 7, verse 9. Ezekiel 21, verse 9. Son of man. So this is the picture of the son of man here for 40 days, prophesying and, and proclaiming. When they see themselves compassed about, flee to the mountains. Get out of here. What did he say he would do in Luke 11? He said he would do as Jonah did and warn for 40 days as Jonah did. This is the prophetic picture of it. Son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord, a sword, a sword is sharpened and also furbished. It is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. Verse 11, halfway through, to give it into the hand of the slayer. He's warning during the 40 days. That he's about to re to give the sword. There's about to be the release of the great sword. When they're going to kill each other. Nation against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. He's the son of man warning as the white horse rider for 40 days. That the when, the when he's done. And that red horse. That second seal is broken. The sword which is furbished and sharpened. Is about to be given to the slayer. In verse 14 it says. Thou therefore son of man prophesy. Smite thine hands together and let the sword be doubled. The third time, the sword of the slain. Verse 15, I have set the point of the sword against all their gates, that their heart may faint and their ruins be multiplied. Ah, it might be bright. It is wrapped up for the slaughter. Now listen to this. Verse 16, go thee one way or the other. This is the word, brothers and sisters, right here. The root word of Ehud. The root word of Ehud in the midst of the time when it may be Ehud Barak in charge, potentially, and the root of his name is to unify, and in the midst of the 50 days, during the 40 days of the Son of Man, we see the wording of unifying of Ehud before the great sword of the red horse rider is given at nation against nation during the warning of the son of man who is the white horse rider. Are you getting the picture? Do you think we've got revelation being revealed to us? Do you think it's been happening? I can guarantee you it's happening. It's happening. I mean, take your time, brothers and sisters. Go back through this video. Seek and search these things out. We can now see from, from what literally events taking place, what they're trying to bring about to the people's names in Scripture with a first name and a last name connected to the time when there would be an attempt for this unity during the 40 days of the Son of Man, while the Son of Man prophetic is warning about the sword that's coming that is going to be Syria that brings the devastation as the picture of Ishmael at the seventh month after the first attack that was on the fifth month while the Ehud was there, Barak, which is connected to the light affliction in the north with Zebulun and Naphtalim, which is a picture of of what? I just had a <laughs> I just had a hiccup, which is a picture of Haifa and Tel Aviv, the light affliction that begins on the fifth and the seventh month, the light affliction to the affliction that removes them, with the Son of Man here as the white horse rider during 40 days, warning them that the sword is going to be released, and when Peace is taken from the earth at the 50th day, and they've gone out from Jerusalem. That sword is released of the red horse rider, which is the sword 
that will bring about the great sword, which is, which is the great sword, and brings about nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And brothers and sisters, just in case you didn't remember that, we can show how this equals 70 years from when they first got a portion of Jerusalem, and we can show how this is the end of 70 years from when they got the rest of Jerusalem in a 1967 count. We know that when those 70 years are done, it's the final 14th year of the wrath of the Lord. And when that year is over, it's the final Jubilee year. And it's a total picture of the pre-trib bride, feast of weeks, Leah, feast of the Lord. Then a picture of the sixth to the seventh year of the feast of the Lord, of the Rachel to unleavened bread, and the seven to the eighth year tabernacles as the years for the Judah portion to the Lord and the final jubilee when the 14th year is all over. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what more to tell you. Can I go more detailed than this? Absolutely. We're coming up on three hours. One of my, the, that, that well understood time frame we hit now recently quite a bit, but could I have done this? I can go through every single gospel. I can connect it to, to Revelation. I can connect it to other books in the New Testament through a ton of the prophets throughout uh, the Old Testament to the beginning of creation, to the book of Psalms, to the book of the Kings and the Chronicles, to Daniel, to all of these places. I could do this for a 10, 12, 15 hour video and still not cover everything showing the truth of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to, what they prophetically revealed to us in the revelation of the end of days, which is 14 years and above, how it plays out, when their portion is, and how they're all associated to the harvests and the feasts of the Lord connected to the prophetic picture of the creations in the beginning, of the Spirit, then the light, then the flesh. Brothers and sisters, please, if you haven't understood Take your time, watch this part by part, piece by piece, follow the scriptures along, see where these names are. Look at the definitions of their names. Look at where they show up in scripture, in, in the history and in the is of even Ehud and Barak, Ehud, Barak, and Ehud and Omer. It is incredible. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray that it strengthens you to, to keep watch, to keep diligently seeking to keep in prayer. Remember to pray for all of our brothers and sisters. Remember, if you can support, help us support to continue to grow the ministry here and abroad over in Uganda and surrounding communities and pray for the people in Israel, brothers and sisters. I believe the Lord is trying to wake them up. He's trying to get the world to pray for them. He's trying to get them to wake up and to repent and to cry out to him. But we know it's not going to be enough. But does that mean you do nothing? No. We still do everything we can. We still pray. We still pray and strengthen and watch and encourage. Because we will save some along the way. And how exciting is that? To help wake others up out of their slumber and save them from this incredible devastation that's coming. But it's all in the Lord God's will. It is all understood. And believe it or not, it is all done in his love. Sounds crazy to people on the outside. But when you understand the purpose of tribulation, you will understand it is the greatest show of his love. Because if he never did it, they would be lost forever. It has to be so devastating that they will cry out to him on hands and knees for mercy to come and save them. That's what it will take. Brothers and sisters, I love you so much. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. I pray for you and for your families, those that I've met and know, those that I don't know. I pray for each and every one of you and everybody that we're reaching. And I cannot wait. So we get to stand before the Son of Man, prayerfully having been accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, never having tasted of death, having been his modern day end time Enoch's to be his pre-trib escape 
bride of Christ or his remaining remnant worker bride like those 14thers, 14ers we are and his Smyrna priestly working line that we may have a portion with him in the millennial reign. However, the Lord plays it out for each and every one of us. I look forward to meeting you all. And it will not be too much longer, brothers and sisters. One way or the other, we are the final generation. And it's knocking at the door. I love you again. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.